Welcome hearth and homies to tonight's compilation, Boston Blackie, an enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Now this radio show is based on characters from the Columbia Pictures series, which starred Chester Morris as Blackie. Now this character was created by writer Jack Boyle while he was serving time in San Quentin prison. He began writing under the pen name number 6066, and his first stories appeared in the American magazine in 1914. The character would go on to be featured in films, and then in June of 1944, Blackie would make the move to radio. Now that show was just a summer replacement show, and it starred Chester Morris as Blackie again. The shows that we're listening to tonight come from the second run of the series that started in 1945 and ran until 1950. Richard Colmer took over as Boston Blackie, and Jan Minor starred as Mary Wesley. Now Boston Blackie is one of my favorite shows. Uh, and it's just something about the atmosphere of it. It's just a fun show. Uh, it doesn't really get too deep, and sometimes the stories are a little bit of a leap, but uh, it's just, it's just, I don't know, good old-fashioned fun. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Now, every time I play one of these, I always get some comments about the organ music. Personally, I like the organ music, but for the most part, I try to present the shows as they were recorded. Now, I will cut out at the end. Sometimes there's filler music or different things that really aren't part of the show. And for all you organ haters, I did cut out the organ fill music at the end of these. But we're going to have to compromise. There's still some organ music in it. It's just part of the show. But we've taken this old time classic radio show, Boston Blackie, organ music and all, and paired it with some beautiful scenery to give you a unique old time radio viewing experience. Or as I've started calling it, the visual radio. So sit back and relax and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. So you get away from my king after this move. Think you got me, huh? Why not? This is why not. Why, Don't you... Get sore, Harry. This is only a checker game. Not the way you play it. Well, you still got a chance, king or no king. Yeah, maybe. If you don't make any more dumb moves, you have. I could answer that, but there's no use partners being sore at each other over a little game of... Just a minute. Bill Morton's garage... Oh, yeah? What kind? Okay, go buy it from the owner right away. What was that, Bill? Good news? Great. A car cracked up at Hanley Bridge just a little while ago. Oh, that's well. What make? 1942 Buick Convertible Coupe. 1942 Convertible Coupe, huh? Yeah, Buick. I sent Tom out to steal one just like it. Now meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Hello? Mary, this is Blackie. Yes, darling? Uh, thanks for the use of your car, Mary, but you don't have another one I can borrow while mine's in the garage, do you? Why? What's wrong with my car, Blackie? Uh, nothing much. I parked it out in front of the courthouse a few minutes ago. When I went back to get it, it was stolen. Stolen? Stolen, unless it's part homing pigeon and left for its garage by itself. Oh, dear. Well, don't worry about it, Mary. It's insured, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I'm not worried about that part of it. I'll probably get it back anyway. But it certainly spoils my trip. Well, no, it doesn't. My car will be fixed in a day or so. You can borrow that. Oh, thanks, Blackie. Could I? Oh, it's the least I can do for you. Okay, now I feel better. Oh, oh, will you do me another favor, though? Sure. Remember the route you marked for me on that road map? Yes. Well, it was in my car, so I'll need another one. I'll pick one up today. Thanks, darling. Look, Mary, uh, I want to get the police on this right away. Better give me some identifying details about that car of yours. Oh, yeah, sure. What do you need to know? Oh, engine number and so forth. 
All I know now is that it's a 1942 Buick convertible. Goodbye, Blackie. I'll say goodbye in a minute, Inspector. First, I want you to do something for me. What is this? Be kind to Boston Blackie week? That's next week. Right now, this is do something for Mary Wesley hour. Mary Carr's been stolen. You come to me about a stolen car? Yes, I know stolen cars are out of your department, but I thought you could use your influence to get some fast action in finding it. You do have influence around here, don't you? I don't think so. At least not enough to keep you out of my office. Well, that's because I have a certain amount of influence myself. Oh, come on, Faraday. Be a sport. If you won't do this for me, do it for Mary. Oh, all right. As long as it's for her. What kind of a car is it? 1942 Buick Convertible. Engine number? Hmm, let me see. Uh, 2936741. Four, one. Uh-huh. Anything else? Nothing of importance. The thieves can, can't get rid of pair of ladies' gloves, flashlight, the usual junk. But don't bother about those things. I won't. Oh, there's a slight dent and a rather long scratch on the right rear fender. Dent and scratch on rear fender. Right. Okay, Blackie, uh, I'll do what I can. But I want you to understand something. I know what it is, Faraday. You aren't doing this for me, you're doing it for Mary. Well, I'm sure she appreciates it. <laughs> Come it, Tom. Okay, Mr. Morton. Pete and I are putting the motor from the wrecked car into the stolen car right now. Lord, easy, Pete. Okay, Tom. Okay. Hey, I know this car. Where'd you pick it up? In front of the courthouse. It's a little while ago, Mr. Morton. Any trouble? Ah, uh, not a bit. Hold it, Pete. Okay. Engine's in place now. Now, a couple of minutes more. I have another job all done. Uh, thanks, Pete. You can go back upstairs now. I'll take it from here. Okay, Tom. You can call me if you need me. Yeah. I gotta laugh. Yeah, Mr. Morton? Why? Why? You know who this stolen car belongs to? Nah. To Mary Wesley. She parks it right here in my garage. Yeah? Well, I wouldn't know about that. I work down here in the basement most of the time. What are you griping about? This is where you do your best work. Got everything cleaned out of her car? Yeah. We'll get rid of everything. Don't worry. Good. Be sure you get rid of the motor out of Miss Wesley's car. We don't want that laying around. Don't worry, I said. Uh -oh. Somebody upstairs wants to get their car out, I guess. Pete must be busy. Hold the hammer, Tom. Okay. I'm through anyway. Yeah? Mr. Morton? Yeah, Pete? The lady up here wants to see you. Miss Wesley, she wants to talk to you. Oh. Tell her I'm not here. Okay. No, wait. I'll send Tom up to talk to her. Okay. Hey, Tom. Yeah, Mr. Morton? The Wesley dame is upstairs. You go talk to her, will you? Talk to her? What'll I say? Nothing. Just hear what she has to say. Okay. You got the motor from the wrecked car in, so this Wesley gal's car will run? It's all set to travel, Mr. Morton. Okay, go up and see what the Wesley dame wants. Yeah. If she wants me, I'm not here. Okay, boss. I'll remember. I'm smart that way. Hi, Pete. Where is this Miss Wesley? Over there by the gas pumps, Tom. Thanks. I'm Tom, the mechanic. You want something, Miss Wesley? Yes, I do. What she wants is a car. I can talk for myself, Blackie. Thank you. Tom, do you have a car I can rent? Mine's been stolen. Ah, oh, that's too bad, miss, but we don't have a thing. Well, it was a nice try, Mary. Maybe my garage will let us have one. No, Blackie, we'll just wait till yours is ready. I'm sorry I can't help you, miss. Uh, is that all you wanted? Yes, thanks. Well, I hope you get your car back, miss. Thanks, so do I. Come on, Blackie. Let's hop in a cab and go down to my garage. Maybe they... Say, Pete. Yeah, Tom? Did you get that new grease gun from Barney's? No, not yet. You better run over there and get it right away. I'm going to need it. Okay, but who'll watch things up here? I'm through downstairs. I'll take over. Right. Be back in half an hour. Okay. I'm going downstairs to see the boss a minute. You still down here, Mr. Morton? Sure. What did the Wesley name want, Tom? Oh, to rent a car. 
<laughs> Isn't that a hot one? With her own car right down here. Yeah. But let her try to claim this is hers now, with that new motor in it. Yeah, let her try. Here's your dough, Tom. Twenty-five bucks. Uh, look, Mr. Morton, I've been wanting to talk to you. Yeah? This job's getting to be worth more than twenty-five bucks a car. Both think so? I do. I don't. I think I ought to get a hundred dollars a job from now on. Or maybe I might do some talking someplace. Oh, really? Yeah. Um... I'll start by taking a hundred for this one. It's not too much. You and your partner, Harry, make almost a thousand clear. Where's every... Pete? Upstairs? Pete? I sent Pete to Barney's for a grease gun. Oh, uh, don't get me off the hundred bucks. I want it. It's as simple as that, see? No, it isn't, Tom. It's as simple as this. No! <laughs> One for luck, Jim. Harry's used cars. Harry, this is Bill Morton. I got another car ready for you. The one you picked up today? Yeah, the engine from the wrecked car is in it. In good shape, too. We ought to get 900 to 1,000 for this one. Good. I'll send for it right away. Swell. And by the way, Harry, we'll need a new mechanic. New mechanic? Why? What's the matter with Tom? Tom? Oh, he don't work here anymore. Hasn't there been any trace of my car at all, Blackie? Not a sign of it, Mary. If Faraday would have called me. <laughs> now relax and enjoy this country road. Oh, dear. I do hate to take your car when I go away. What'll you do for one? Well, whoever stole your car has been pretty successful in keeping it hidden for a whole day. Maybe I'll steal one, too. Oh, Blackie. You... <laughs> Don't worry, Mary. Blackie, I'll... look! At what? That car that just passed us, that's my car. It's a Buick convertible, all right. Sure it's yours? Yes, yes, yes. Look, the, the plates are different, but there's a dent and a scratch on the right rear fender. You're right, Mary, there is. Well, what do we do? Catch that guy and make him pull over. Oh, careful, Blackie. He may not want to play. This is going to happen. So fast, he won't have time to play. Oh, watch it. Pull over there, you. Pull over. Blackie! Blackie, look out! Look out, nothing. I'm cutting him off. He's stopping now, brother. You Be stay careful. here, Mary. That driver may get tough about this. Blackie, time. Blackie, he's running away. This ought to stop him. Oh, Blackie, don't you kill him. I was just firing into the air, but it didn't stop him anyway. Oh, let him go, darling. All I want is my car, and I I have that now. Well, let's take a look at it to make sure. All right. Hey, it's my car, all right. Look, same upholstery inside and everything. It's amazing. <laughs> we don't usually have this much luck. Well, it's all yours again, so hop in and drive back to town. What do you know? I, uh, I, I think I'd rather not, though. Why? Well, I don't know. But the man we caught driving it might still be around. Yeah, that's a good thought. Well, if it leaves your mind, I suggest you take my car and I'll drive yours. I get it, Blackie. <clears throat> Auto suggestion. <laughs> Yo. You speaking to me, officer? Yeah. Where'd you get the... Well, if it isn't Boston Blackie. And if it isn't Officer Smith. Don't tell me I went through a red light back there. Nope. Well, if I did, I'll stop on a green one to make up for it. You're sitting in a bad car to make jokes, Blackie. Oh, the car's all right. It's only my jokes that are bad. There's nothing wrong with the car, Blackie. Just what it was used for last night. Huh? What? 1942 Buick convertible with these license plates was seen out in the country at 9 o'clock last night. And the driver dumped a dead body out of it. Now, back to Boston Blackie. <laughs> An 
1942 Buick convertible is wrecked, and Mary Wesley's car, also a 1942 Buick convertible, is stolen. The thieves buy the wrecked car, lift out its engine, and put it in Mary's car, thereby removing from Mary's car one of its surest means of identification, the engine number. Tom, the mechanic who switches the engines from the wrecked to the stolen cars, threatens to go to the police if he's not given more money. So Bill Morton, his boss, shoots and kills him. The next day, Blackie spots Mary's car and forces it to the curb. The driver flees, but Blackie drives Mary's car back to town where a policeman informs him that a dead body had been dumped from that car the night previous. As we return to our story, Blackie has been taken to Inspector Faraday's office. So you killed a guy, huh, Blackie? And stole a car, huh? And drove out in the country, huh? And dumped the body, huh? And you thought you could get away with it. (laughs) You forgot the last huh, Faraday. Huh? All right, huh? Now look, you. You came in here yesterday and asked me to find a stolen car for you. Mary Wesley's car. That wasn't stolen, was it? You had it. I didn't have it, Faraday. Not until just now. I caught a guy driving it, forced him to the side of the road, and took the car away from him. A great story. Where's the driver you took the car away from? Well, he got away. Yeah, yeah. I was only interested in getting Mary's car back. Yeah. I wasn't interested in chasing... Inspector Faraday. Marilyn. I checked the motor numbers in that car Blackie was driving. And they were the engine numbers of Mary's car, right? No, Blackie. Wrong. They weren't. What? So, Blackie. You're driving a stolen car, huh? No, Faraday. So help me, that's Mary's car I'm driving. She identified it herself. Well, maybe she needs glasses. Or she's been around you so long, uh, maybe she needs brains. Uh, the telephone. Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Callahan in the stolen car department. Don't bother me. Look, Inspector, you asked us to find a 1942 Buick convertible stolen from a Miss Mary Wesley. Well? We just got a call from Leonard Wells that somebody stole a car from him about an hour ago. And it was a 1942 Buick convertible. I know the answer to that one, Callahan. I've got the guy who lifted it. I'll handle this. Blackie, what's the matter with you? The car you're driving belongs to a Leonard Wells, not a Mary Wesley. What? Faraday, there's something wrong here. I'll say there's something wrong here. I just said that. Look, give me a couple of hours and let me find out what this is all about. Nothing doing. Oh, come on, Inspector. Be a sport. No. Why not? Aren't you the athletic type? I'm the type who can't stand jokes like that. But I'll give you two hours. And if you haven't cleared yourself in that time, you'll get two years. Yes. Are you Leonard Wells? Yes. Your car was uh, stolen today, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Gave me quite a scare, too. Somebody cut me off. I thought it was a stick-up, so I ran. I'd like to talk to you about that. May I come in? Sure. Thanks. That was your car, Mr. Wells? It was. Do you have proof it was yours? I bought it. Where? Harry's used cars. When? Yesterday. You have a bill of sale? Sure. Where is the bill of sale? Right here. Mm-hmm. Engine and license number matches the car I was driving, all right. Why should they? Good question, Mr. Wells. Now I'm going out and look for an answer to match. Are you the owner of this car lot? Yeah, I'm Harry. Got the best used cars in town right here. I don't doubt it. Uh... Can you give me a little information? Sure. I'd be glad to give you anything you want, mister. Did you sell a car to Leonard Wells today? Yeah, sure did. Fine car, too. One of the best I've had in a long time. A 1942 Buick convertible. He recommend me to you? Yes, in a way. Uh, where'd you get the car, Harry? I bought it, mister. A fellow by the name of Jack Brown. Banged it up at Hanley Bridge the night before last. I bought it from him. Jack Brown, huh? Thanks. Oh, think nothing of it, mister. Think nothing of it. <laughs> Yes, this is my car, all right, Blackie. The one I cracked up at Hanley Bridge night before last. Lucky my wife and I weren't killed. They sure did a good job of fixing it up. Are you sure this is your car, Mr. Brown? It's got to be, hasn't it? Same make. The engine, the license numbers match the numbers in my bill of sale. What's it doing outside a police station? It was stolen. Stolen? You mean... After I sold it to a fellow from Harry's used cars. I guess so. 
When did you sell it? About a half hour after I wrecked it. He offered me $50 for it, and I took it. Wish I hadn't sold that wreck now. I didn't know it'd be as easy to fix as this. I wish you hadn't sold it either, Bram. For whoever fixed this car of yours fixed me, too. Look, Blackie, you got ten minutes of your two hours to go. Now, why do you bother going to the morgue? Because, Faraday, I followed every other lead and got nowhere. Maybe seeing the body that was dumped out of the car you say I stole will do me some good. Why don't you give up? I wouldn't give you that much pleasure. Where's the body? On that table over there. Let's have a look at it. Okay. But you still have only ten minutes. No, no, nine minutes. Get out of that car stealing rap. I know, I know. Here, I'll pull the sheet back. There. Mm-hmm. How long has it been dead? Since about six o'clock last night. Now will you give up? Later, Faraday. I still have nine... Hey, I've seen this fellow before. Eh? Yeah? Mary and I talked to him yesterday in Bill Morton's garage. So what? So this. Jack Brown said his car was a total wreck after he crashed into Hanley Bridge. Yeah? But now his car's in fine shape. That means a lot of garage work was done on it, right? You mean the car we caught you driving was smashed up... Only night before last? Yes. And what I mean, smashed. And the garage where it was repaired could have been Bill Morton's garage. And this fellow here could have been the mechanic who did the work on it. Could have been, could have been. What good is that? Faraday, I've got the whole thing. Somebody bought Jack Brown's wreck, stole Mary's car because they were both the same make and model, and switched the engine numbers. I'm sorry, Blackie. I thought of a possible switch in engine numbers, too. We have ways of telling if an engine number has been changed. These weren't. Oh, Hey, maybe the motor in Mary's car is the motor in the car that was wrecked. Say, that could be. The motors could have been transferred, and maybe it was this guy who made the switch. Well, maybe. But that doesn't tell us who killed him. His boss might have done it. Why? Even you should be able to figure that out. I can only find out where he was killed. I'll tell you one thing. Maybe he was a mechanic, but he wasn't killed in any garage. He had his street clothes on, and there wasn't a spot of grease on him anywhere. Not on his clothes, Faraday. But look at his hands. They're covered with grease. What does that prove? It proves he was killed while he was still at the garage. All auto mechanics wash their hands with special soap before leaving work. Hey, that's right, Blackie, they do. Somebody wanted to make it seem like he was killed outside and probably switched his overalls for an ordinary suit. Must have forgotten about the grease, though, huh? Well, the grease on this fellow's hands may keep a killer from slipping through our fingers. <laughs> Bill Morton? Yeah? I'm Boston Blackie. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm, uh, doing a little investigating into the death of a mechanic who used to work here. You mean Tom? Tom's dead? Very. Oh, say, that's too bad. I wondered why he didn't come to work today. He couldn't very well. You know much about him? No, he was a good worker. One of the best repairmen I ever had. Worked downstairs in a shop. Oh, Tom worked downstairs, huh? Uh, mind if I go down there and have a look around? Oh, come on. I'll take you down. Thanks. Watch your steps. They're kind of weak, some of them. Thank you. Kind of dark here when no one's working. Wait, I'll turn on a light. There. Say, some shop you have down here. We like it. We can do most anything to a car when we got a good mechanic like Tom was. Sure hate losing him. I saw Tom here yesterday. Where did you see him last? Down here. He went out that door there. That was the last I saw him. Mm, too bad. Kind of messed up place down here. But this is a garage, you know. We don't often have visitors. Now, if we known you were coming. Forget it. Oh, say, here's a road map somebody's thrown away. I need one of these. May I have it? I'll get you brand new one upstairs. No, this is all right. In fact, this is a new one, too. Let's see if it has the right territory inside. Planning on taking a trip? A friend of mine is. Uh-huh. Hmm. This is what I want. Everything I want. Good. Now, Mr. Morton. Yeah? Tom's body was dumped out of a car on a country road last night. Where were you then? Me? I was here all night. Tom's body was dumped out of a car about nine o'clock. You were here then, too? Yeah, I was here from about five o'clock in the afternoon until about five o'clock the next morning. 
One of my nightmen was off sick. Thanks, Mr. Morton. Thanks a lot. What are you doing pulling a gun on me? Accusing you of Tom's murder, that's all. You're crazy. I just told you I was here when Tom's body was dumped in the country. I can prove that. I know you were here, Mr. Morton, which means that somebody else dumped his body for you. But you killed him. What makes you think so? You told me so. I told you. Yes, when you admitted that you were here from five last night until five this morning. Because Tom was shot and killed in this garage at six o'clock last night. You remember to change his clothes after you shot him. But you forgot to wash his hands. Why, you... Too bad, Morton. If Tom's hands had been washed, maybe we'd never be able to guess that your hands weren't clean. Oh, what a lovely day for a drive in the country, Blackie. I'm surprised you wanted to go with me, Mary. Aren't you leaving on your trip tomorrow? I am. And it'll be such a relief to go in my own car. Oh, oh, by the way, you will get me a new road map like you did before, won't you? I certainly will not. Blackie. <laughs> I don't have to, Mary. I've already done it. Here. Oh, you. Thanks. When'd you get it? A few hours ago. Where? In Bill Morton's garage. Darling, do you mean that you had time to catch Bill Morton, get him to confess, and to name that Harry person as his accomplice, and still get me a map? Versatile fellow, huh? To say the least. Speedy, that's me. Well, let's see if you had time to mark the route for me like you did last time. No, no, I didn't. Well, you did so. It's marked. You know when I marked that map, Mary? When? Last week. Last week? Oh, Blackie, the marked road map was in my car when it was stolen. I know. And it was in an ash can in Bill Morton's garage when I went to see him. That's the map you lost, Mary. Then that's how you knew my car had been in Bill's garage and that he was involved in this. Yes, and... Isn't it a bit of an irony, Mary, that when I marked out the route for your trip, I also marked the route for Bill Morton's trip, the last one he'll ever take. Get me the police. One moment, please. 22nd Precinct, Sergeant Mulvaney speaking. Sergeant Mulvaney, this is Dr. Lester Allen. Yes, Doc, what can I do for you? Well, I'm in a house at 1110 Dale Avenue. There's been a murder here. A murder? Well, don't touch anything, don't move anything. We'll be right over. All right, Sergeant. Who's the victim, Doctor? The victim was a patient of mine. Miss Frances Fielding. I'm a psychiatrist, sir. You know how she was killed or who killed her? She was shot. It looks like murder because when I found her just now, the gun was much too far from her body for this to be suicide. Well, just sit tight, Doc. We'll be right over. Uh, Sergeant, I wonder... Yeah, Doc? Oh, nothing. I suppose it's much too irregular. I think I know what you're getting at, Doc. You know a couple of newspaper men will come along with us. You don't want the publicity. No. Frankly, I don't. Well, I tell you what, Dr. Allen. I know who you are, all right. Go back to your office and stay there. We'll be up to talk to you later. Might have to ask you a few questions. Of course, Sergeant. I'm sure I can answer them to your complete satisfaction. <laughs> And now, meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Here's your apartment, Mary. Mm -hmm. Hold the meter, driver. The young lady's getting out here, but I'm going on. Okay. Blackie, look across the street. 
Hey, it looks like a sighting of some kind, Mary. I wonder what it is. It is not for us. I know, not... Hey, the police car over there, the one in front. That's Inspector Faraday's. Oh, now I know what kind of excitement it is. And that is for us. Come on. Kid driver, keep the change. Thanks. Come on, Mary. Oh, golly, do we have two blackies? Does Walter have to run downhill? That was a foolish answer. That's what a foolish question deserves, they tell me. Okay, darling. There's Inspector Faraday coming out to his car. Good. Now we won't have to waste time finding him. Hello, Faraday. Uh, who's that? Who would you expect to turn up about this time? Blackie, I might have known it was you. Hello, Inspector Faraday. What are you doing in my neighborhood? Hello, Miss Wesley. What's murder doing in your neighborhood? Murder, Faraday? Yeah. In that house there. A girl by the name of Frances Fielding. Now, don't look at me, Faraday. Mary and I were at the Mercedes restaurant tonight, and I have a dozen witnesses to prove it. The girl was killed about 8 o'clock. I suppose you were at the Mercedes then? Yes, we were. See anybody around here before you went to eat? I didn't. I didn't either. Oh, wait. I met Dr. Allen here. In fact, he went right into this house. He was going in to see a patient, he said. Remember, Mary? Hey, that's right. Dr. Allen, huh? Dr. Lester Allen, the psychiatrist. I think I'll go over and have a talk with him. Farley, you don't think... That... I do think, Blanky. That's something you don't give me credit for. That's something that's going to get you in trouble someday. Someday. Uh, I'll see you later, Blanky. Much later, I hope. But, Faraday, you aren't going to pin this on Dr. Allen, are you? Not unless he did it. Well, he didn't. I've known him for years. Well, then, maybe that's why he did it. Knowing you has made him tired of going straight. <laughs> I like that. Do you, Inspector? Well, Dr. Allen's a nice guy. If you're going to see him, I'm going with you. How do you like that? <laughs> Dr. Allen, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Of course, Inspector Faraday. Give him routine answers, Doctor. He won't know the difference. Quiet, Blanky. Dr. Allen, when was the last time you saw Francis Fielding alive? Uh, this afternoon, here in my office. Is that the last time you saw her? Alive? Yes. I talked to her on the phone later. She called me. Told me she was terribly upset. About what? Well, she came to see me this afternoon for treatment. She was suffering from a neurosis. She was afraid she was going to kill herself. Uh, never mind about that neurosis stuff. Now, after Miss Fielding called this evening, what did you do? I did as she asked. I went to see her. So you admit you were there, do you? Well, of course I do. In fact, Blackie saw me going in to see her. That's why you're being questioned, Doctor. I had to open my big mouth. Uh, well, shut it, Blackie. Dr. Allen, you mean to tell me you went to the Fielding home, found Miss Fielding dead, and left without calling the police? Without calling... Look here, Inspector, I did call the police. Y you called the police? Now, please, Doctor, don't give me that. But I did. I talked to a Sergeant Mulvaney. Mulvaney? There's no such sergeant at headquarters. And no call ever came into headquarters. I checked but that. I, I don't understand. This is absolutely fantastic. Where is it? If you talked to the police, why weren't you at the scene of the murder when the police arrived? Why? Because yeah. the sergeant Mulvaney said he knew me. And it would be all right if I waited for the police right here in my office. Ah, uh, you don't tell very good lies, Dr. Allen. And you don't tell them well, either. Come on, come on. Why did you kill her? I didn't kill her. I never saw her before this afternoon. Can you prove that, Doctor? Well, uh... I don't know. I, I might. My secretary, Miss Glenn, she might... Uh, get her in here, Blanky. Sure. You never saw Francis Fielding before this afternoon, huh? No. And my appointment book will prove it. All right, Doctor. It isn't going to matter much. But I hope you're telling the truth for a change. There she is. Thanks, Blanky. Uh, Miss Glenn, when did Francis Fielding first have an appointment with Dr. Allen? About eight months ago, Inspector. Eight months? Miss Glenn! Eight months, huh? That's not true, Inspector. Miss Glenn, what's the matter with you? You know I never saw that girl until she walked into my office this afternoon. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Dr. Allen. Did I say something wrong? You said something right, Miss Glenn. Look here, Inspector. This whole thing is absolutely... Why, my appointment book shows she was here for the first time today. It shows you saw her for the first time eight months ago. Or Miss Glenn wouldn't say so. I'm afraid it does, Doctor. Here's my book. See for yourself. I'll take that book. Uh, you answer your phone, Doctor. Thank you. Hello. Dr. Lester Allen? Yes, can you talk? No, I can't talk to anyone now. Call me back in a few minutes. Okay, I'll call back in a very few minutes. Now listen, Inspector. You listen, Doctor. You're not in a position to do much talking. You look like a murder suspect to me. Faraday, you're all wrong. Quiet, Blanky. I'm all right. The doctor's lying about the phone call to the police and about when he first met the dead girl. And I think that makes it look like maybe he killed her. Motive, Faraday, motive. What was his motive? I'll find one, don't worry. Uh, don't leave town, Dr. Allen. I may want you to come down and see me sometime. Come on, Blackie. Let's go. Wait, Blackie. I want to talk to you. All right. See you later, Faraday. I'm warning you, Blackie. 
You stay out of this. Tell that to someone who hasn't solved most of your cases for you. Uh, Miss Glenn, show Inspector Faraday the way out, will you? Of course. Right this way, Inspector. Doctor, I'm awfully sorry. In a way, I got you into this. I'm not blaming you, Blackie. I understand all you did was say you saw me at Miss Fielding's house. What I don't... Oh. Excuse me. Hello? Hello, Dr. Allen. Can you talk now? Yes. This is Roger Fielding. Francis Fielding's brother. Oh, yes. Uh, well, just a minute. What's the matter, Doctor? Blackie, this is Francis Fielding's brother. Should I talk to him? Yes, but let me listen, too. Is there an extension I can use? Yes, right there on that table. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and talk to him now. Yes, Mr. Fielding, uh, what is it? You know what it is, Doc. It's about what you did to my sister. What I did to her? That's right, she's dead. Don't try to tell me you didn't kill her. What makes you think I did? Her little diary told me so. Just let me read you what it says here on one of the pages. Kept for a year, and you're on every page. This is seven months ago. It says, I love Lester so, and he says he loves me. But I know one of these days he'll leave me to go back to his wife. I envy Mrs. Allen so, but I won't let him go. I just won't let him go. Look here, I didn't even know your sister seven months ago. Listen to this, Doc. This is even better. Here's what it says on a page of her diary about a month ago. She wrote, Lester's throwing me over. I just know he is. And if he does, I'll go to Mrs. Allen with the truth. I'll tell her everything. Listen, Doc. What? I don't know why you killed my sister, but I got a rough idea. She sort of asked for it, didn't she? Now, look. You look, Doc. Maybe sis got what was coming to her, but the cops got this diary coming to them. Unless you want it. And bad. This is blackmail. Is that what it is? I think I'm doing you a favor. Meet me at Dobbs Hill at 10 tomorrow night. On account of I like to do favors. Hello. Hello. It's no use, Doctor. You hung up. Blackie, what do you think? Well, Faraday broke down your story about calling the police and not meeting the dead girl until this afternoon and said all he needed to arrest you was a motive. What I just heard on the phone would pass as a motive, all right. Blackie, you know I had nothing to do with this. No. Well, Dr. Allen, either this is first-class frame-up or you're a third-degree liar. Golly, Blackie. The feeling home is spooky enough upstairs. Do we have to stay down here in the basement much longer? Only until we find telephone wires that look as if they've been tampered with. What will that prove, Blackie? Well, Doctor, when you made your call to the police, you got through the operator all right, didn't you? Yes. But before you got the police, there was a long pause, huh? Yes, quite long. Then the Sergeant Mulvaney answered. But there's no such person on the force. You didn't talk to the police, but maybe to someone here in the basement. Blackie, do you want wires that look as if they've been cut? Or wires with tape on them, Mary... To cover a place where they've been scraped. Well, here are two of them. Two is what we want. Come on, Doctor. Aren't you glad you brought me? These are the wires we want, all right. Can you tell if they've been tapped? Easily. Just look at them. The wires have been separated, the insulation scraped off, then the bare wires taped together again. Does this really prove the doctor's story about talking to a Sergeant Mulvaney? Yes, Mary. Here's why. Whoever tricked the doctor into thinking he was talking to the police was down here when the doctor dialed the operator. I did get the operator, then. That was legitimate. Oh, yes. But after you got the operator, it was a long pause, you said. Yes, there was. Blackie, Dr. Allen was cut off during that pause. That's right, Mary. It was the man down here who took over his call to the police, probably asked them some foolish questions, then hung up on them. Then the man switched the doctor back in and and talked to him. Exactly. And you, Dr. Allen, thought you were talking to the police. Well, all the time, you were talking to the man down here. Well, who was that man, though? Francis, feelings killer, probably. I think I feel better already. You believe me now, don't you? I think so. But we'll never convince Faraday you're innocent if he sees the dead girl's diary. I've got to keep that meeting with a brother tonight. Yes, but in the meantime, we'd better work on another angle. What, Blackie? The reason for the girl's death. What would be a good reason? Well, um, money. That's enough. But enough for not... If we could find she carried insurance payable to someone who had a chance to kill her, that would be enough for me.
Now, back to Boston Blackie. Psychiatrist Lester Allen receives a phone call from his new patient, Frances Fielding, to come to her home at once. He goes there, finds her murdered, and calls police. He is told to go back to his office. Inspector Faraday finds no record of Allen's call and believes him guilty. As we return to our story, Boston Blackie, who is with Mary and Dr. Allen, calls Faraday in search of a motive for the girl's murder. Maybe this will work. At least it's worth a try. Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Now, what do you want? The usual, Faraday, to give you a little help. I'd rather have the measles. Next week, Faraday. This week, I want to give you an angle on the fielding murder. I think it's insurance. Uh, Blackie, I don't know how I'd get along without you. I do. Not very well. You know, it's amazing that you'd think of insurance at a time like this. What's amazing about it, Faraday? If you were any kind of a cop, you'd have thought about it long ago. Uh, I thought of it last night. Is that long enough ago for you? (laughs) Well, Faraday, you're improving. What did you find out? None of your business. What are you doing, Faraday? Faking? I'll bet you don't know a thing about the Fielding Girls Insurance. Bet you never even thought of it. Oh, I didn't think of it, huh? Well, a copy of the policy is right here on my desk. I don't believe it. You don't, huh? All right, listen to this. I'm listening. She had an accident policy with $5,000 for accidental death. Mm Mm-hmm. She took it out uh, two years ago and collected on it uh, five months ago for a broken arm. And now all the money from the policy goes to her grandmother in Mexico City. Oh, her grandmother, huh? Yes. And if you think her grandmother killed her, think again. Because she's a 97-year-old invalid and hasn't been out of Mexico City in 30 years. Well, wise guy, uh, don't bother me with your bright ideas. Faraday. Faraday! Did he hang up on you, Blackie? He sure did, Mary. Was she killed for insurance? No. Oh, gee, so now what? Now, Mary, you're going home to see a bed about some sleep, and Dr. Allen and I are going to Dobbs Hill to see a man about a diary. There's his car, parked on the other side of the road. Now, you stay down there in the back of your car. You sure it's safe for you to go over and talk to him? You sure this fellow's never seen you? No, he's never seen me. At least I don't think so. Well, I'd better go on over and talk to him before he gets suspicious. I'll try and sound as much like you as I can. Sit tight. Here I go. All right. Good luck. Roger Fielding? Yeah. Dr. Allen? Yes. How are you, Doc? I don't know. Let me see that diary. Sure. Here you are. This is the original. Thanks. Hmm. Don't bother trying to run off with it. I've got photostatic copies. Get me? I got you. I want you to notice something, Doc. She wrote in her diary every day. Every single day. Yes, so I see. And every day, every single day, she wrote about Doc Allen. Nice diary, huh? Pretty incriminating. Pretty valuable to me. It's her handwriting, and she kept it about a year. Hold it. I want to compare writing with a note she sent me asking for an appointment here. All right. Yeah. She wrote the diary all right? Sure she did. Now, I'm not asking much, Doc. Only a little. Now... And later? A little more. And after that? Oh, whenever I get a little pushed for cash, then either you come across with the money like a nice guy, or I take this diary to the cops. What for? What for? It gives you a pretty good reason for killing it. Yes, it does, Fielding. There's only one thing wrong with it. What's that? It's a phony. A phony, huh? Let me tell you something. What? As a doc, you're a phony, too. The next time, tell Doc Allen he better show in person. Mr. Boston Blackie. I'm still...
still sorry I couldn't fool that guy, Doctor. Well, it was a nice try, Blackie. Uh, let's go into my office. Maybe we can think of something else. We've got to, or Inspector Faraday will come running after you I'm with I'm running, a... Blackie. I'm waiting. Hello, Faraday. Good evening, Inspector. I'm sure glad to see you, Doctor. I was afraid you'd skip town. No. All I did was drive out. For a little air, Faraday. After that conversation with you last night, he needed Try it. Try it, Blackie. Dr. Allen, I'm taking you to headquarters. What for? Questioning. Faraday, you can't do that. The doctor knows less about that girl's death than you do, if that's possible. Well, I suppose you know all about it, huh? I know you need a motive before you can really pin this on a doctor. Give me time. I'll find one. I'll save you time. I've already found it. A diary written by Francis Fielding and containing plenty of motive for murder. Where? Jackie! Don't get excited, either of you. The diary's a phony. A phony? How do you know? Blackie, you know that diary's a counterfeit? How? How? Very simple, Doctor. Faraday, do you remember the accident policy the fielding girl had? Sure. Uh, she collected on it, too, for a broken right arm. About, uh, well, it was exactly five months ago. Well, guess what was in Miss Fielding's diary five months ago? Blank pages. Her arm was broken. The pages weren't blank, Faraday. Her mind was... About that broken right arm. The day-to-day -day account continued six months ago, just as if her arm was perfectly all right. Well, that does prove the diary was a counterfeit. It was probably written just recently, perhaps in the last few weeks. That's exactly it, Doctor. She was so anxious to phony up a long-time love affair in a diary, she forgot she couldn't write six months ago. All right, Blackie. So that diary was phony. So the diary was a frame. I suppose you think everything else about this case is a frame against the doctor, too. Yes. Who framed him? I think the girl did it. And killed herself to do it? That's a good one. That's too good, Faraday. I can't figure out that part at all. But she was part of a frame against the doctor. That much I do know. Look, will you quit trying to do my thinking for me? Somebody has to. You don't. I don't, huh? Well, Dr. Allen here says he met the fielding girl for the first time yesterday, but his own appointment book shows he's been seeing her for eight months. Explain that. I can't understand it. I can. You were lying. Just as you were lying when you said you called the police. He thought he did call them, Faraday. What do you mean, thought he did? Whoever killed Miss Fielding tapped the phone in her house and pretended to be the police. Yeah? How do you know? I did a very strange thing for me, Faraday. I investigated. And look, have you ever heard of Roger Fielding? Roger Fielding. Roger Fielding sounds familiar. How familiar? I think he was arrested once. He served time, too. What for? I don't know, but I can find out. Well, you find out why Roger Fielding was arrested. And if it's for what I hope it is, maybe I'll find out why you can arrest him again. Who are you looking up in the phone book, Blackie? Catherine Glenn, Mary, the doctor's secretary. Why? Well, apparently found out that Roger Fielding used to work for the telephone company. Went to jail for stealing payphone collections. I knew he was responsible for this frame-up as soon as he flashed the phony diary, but I wanted to make sure. Oh, I see. And when you found out he'd worked for the phone company at one time, you figured he knew how to tap the phone in his sister's house. Right. Hmm. Let me see. Yeah, the only thing I have to prove now is that Catherine Glenn was working with Fielding. And of course, she phonied up Dr. Allen's appointment book. Ah, oh, here's the number. Uh, darling, where's Dr. Allen now? At headquarters, poor guy. Faraday wouldn't wait. Oh. What are you going to say to Miss Glenn? I'm going to pretend I'm Roger Fielding and see what she says to me. Oh, again. Happy pretending. <laughs> Thanks. Hello? Okay. This is Roger. Roger who? You don't know? I think I do, but Look, then... I have to see you. What about? Just to check on a few things. Such a... You ought to know. I ought to know who you are, but I don't. You don't? No. Unless you couldn't be Boston Blackie by any chance. What happened? Nothing. She knew who I was. I'm not very good at fooling people tonight, Darling, apparently. Darling, you never were very good at fooling me. I was never trying to pin a murder on you. I have never given you the chance, though. Well, Fielding and Miss Glenn have. And I'm going to take it, too. There's just one more thing I can do. Hello. 
Roger. Yes? This is Kay Glenn. What's the idea of calling me? Look, I'm scared. About what? I, I don't want to tell you over the phone. I'd better wait till I see you. What's the matter? I'll tell you later. All right. Can you come right away? Yes. Well, hurry before it's too late. <laughs> Oh, come in, Roger. What's up, Kay? What's the trouble? Uh, wait till I lock the door. Kind of jumpy, kid. What's the matter? Nothing. I, I just want to talk to you. What about? About how things are going. You know the answer to that yourself. Great. But I'm upset. Why? Because of Frances. Well, why be upset about her? Because... Roger, why didn't you tell me you were going to kill her? That's what I'm really upset about. <laughs> that? Well, I didn't see any point in telling you about that. Or Francis either, of course. In fact, it was sort of a spur-of-the-moment thing. I double-crossed Francis, who never even dreamed she'd be murdered when she first came along with that plan. I thought it would make a better frame against the doctor. A better one? What was wrong with your first idea? Nothing. I suppose we could have shaken him down for plenty with Francis's diary and the appointment book you fixed up. Then why did you have to kill Francis? Two reasons. It put the doc in a worse spot... And we only have to split two ways instead of three. So, I killed it. Well, I want nothing to do with murder. I'm going to the police. Oh, no, you're not. I killed Francis to make the frame against the dock a good one, and I could kill you and make it perfect. No, you go no. to the police, will you? Uh, no, you won't. You won't. Uh, Inspector. I'm calling a cop, huh? Uh, you say you don't call... Uh, uh, what are you doing? Uh, uh, you called the wrong man, Kay. I got here first. Oh, Thanks, Blackie. He, he was going to choke me. You can come out now, Faraday. The danger's over. Oh, very funny. I had to slip up behind Fielding and slug him, or he'd have choked Miss Glenn here. Yeah, I know. And I heard plenty before you clipped him. I guess you did it that, Faraday. You know, I just couldn't get along without you. What would I do for laughs? You'd look in the mirror. Well, I got to revive this guy now and get him down to headquarters. I, I suppose I'm going to headquarters, too. Yes, Miss Glenn. But I don't think you'll get what feeling is going to get. You did a good job working with me after Francis was killed. It was your cooperation that helped us break this case. Oh, I, I did my best, Blackie. I had to. When I first got into this, there was no talk about killing Francis Fielding. I... I'm glad Dr. Allen's name is clear. Really, I am. I think the police will believe you, Miss Glenn. Oh, well... For his frame-up against Lester Allen, M.D., Fielding's name from now on is M.U.D. Blackie, there's an insurance man here wants to see you. Well, tell him I don't want any. I told him that, but he says he don't want to sell you nothing. He wants to give you something. Yes, uh, $10,000, Blackie. Huh? Uh, who are you? He's the insurance guy, Blackie. I'm sorry to disturb you so early in the morning, Blackie, but uh, I'm Emo Barnes, agent for the Rodley Insurance Company. Well, that doesn't sound like any reason to wake me up. Then I'm going back to sleep. Uh, perhaps you'll open your eyes for $10,000? For that, I wouldn't even open one eye. No? No. But go away, little man. I'm sleepy. Uh, I realize that, and I hate to be so persistent, but... Uh, uh, Blackie, I want you to do something for me. I, I want you to do something for me, too. Leave me alone. <laughs> I won't offer you money again, Blackie. Instead, I'll offer you a mystery. A mystery I'll guarantee you can't solve. <laughs> Ah, 
And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Barnes, you think there is a mystery I can't solve? Well, solving this one calls for an expert, Blackie. Is that so? Mm Hmm? Oh, Shorty, should I be modest or should I admit he came to the right man? Ah, just be yourself, boss, and solve it for him. (laughs) Thank you, Shorty. (laughs) And now, Barnes, what's this mysterious mystery I can't solve? Uh, Well, it's this, Blackie. My company carries the theft insurance for the Winthrop Jewelry Company. Now, almost every day for the last month, a diamond has been stolen from the workroom where the diamonds are sat into. Uh, rings, clips, brooches, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, there are three diamond setters in the shop, and we know one of the three is guilty. Which one? No, that we don't know, Blackie. Nor do we know how the diamonds are stolen. You see, all three of the men in the shop are searched when they leave. They're searched at the end of the day, you mean? Yes. Oh, uh, what about when they go out to lunch? They don't go out to lunch. All three of them bring their lunches to work and eat in the shop. They never go out during working hours, and no visitors are allowed to come in. Hey, I know a way to stop the diamonds from disappearing. Fire all three diamond setters. Uh, Well, I suggested that to Mr. Winthrop, the owner of the company, but he doesn't think that it's fair to the two men who are not taking diamonds. Mm, He has a point there. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you want me to do? Find out how the diamonds are being taken out of the shop. Now, understand, all three men are thoroughly searched. Not one of them has ever had a diamond on him. Yet almost every day, a diamond is missing. That's very intriguing. Mm -hmm. Who are these three men? Well, uh, there's Hans Van Houten. He's an expert diamond setter from Holland. Uh, He's been with the Winthrop Company for 20 years. Uh Uh-huh. And then there's, uh, let's see, oh, uh, young John Glass. He's Van Houten's protege. And the newest member of the trio is Jim Aldrich, a young man from Georgia. I see. Well, I'd say you have two mysteries, Mr. Barnes. Yes, Who is taking those diamonds, and how are they being smuggled out? Uh, uh, Blackie, I've, uh, I've made plans for you to go to the shop later today as an employee of the Winthrop Company. Under another name, of course, uh, you'll be John Jones. You've made plans for me already, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Pretty sure I'd take this case, weren't you? (laughs) Yes, I was. The method of stealing those diamonds has to be ingenious. Uh, It must interest a man like you. Well, doesn't it? Uh, Not much, Barnes. Give me 30 seconds to get dressed and I'll be right with you. Here is an order for three two-carat diamonds to be set in a platinum ring. Jim, this job I will give to you. Thanks, Van Houten. Soon as I'm through with this polishing machine. Think you ought to trust him with diamonds, Van Houten? Why not, John? I know why he says not to trust me. Glass here thinks that I'm the guy who's stealing the diamonds. John, you should not say such things. Well, one of us has taken the diamonds out of here, and I know I'm not, and I don't think it's you, Mr. Van Hooten, so who's left? I'm left. But either you or your pal Van Hooten can be taking them. Maybe both. How much are you selling them for, huh? Why, you dirty... Take your hands off of me! Sure, I'll take my hands off. Boys, please, boys, boys, no fighting. Uh, It'll do no good to fight. Fighting will not bring back the stolen diamonds. Fighting will not prove who is guilty of this terrible thing. They must not fight. I agree with you, Van Houten. Oh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Winthrop. Uh, hello, Mr. Winthrop. Hello, it's Mr. closing Winthrop. time, gentlemen. You'll go out to be searched as usual. Right, yes, sir? Yes, he is. But before you go, I'd like you to meet a new employee, Mr. John Jones. He'll work in here with you. Hello, fellas. Hello. Mr. Jones, this is Van Houten. How do you do, Mr. Jones? He's in charge here, and this is his protege, John Glass. How do you do, sir? And this is Jim Aldrich. How do you do, sir? Hiya, Jim. You're sure going to like it here, Mr. Jones. We get searched like a bunch of thieves every time we leave work. But the diamonds keep disappearing just the same. Well, gentlemen, Mr. Barnes of the insurance company is in the outer room ready to search you. This won't go on much longer, though. No? Why not? You know who's taking the diamonds? Mr. Barnes told me this morning that he's on the verge of naming the guilty one. Thinks the case is as good as solved. Oh, he does. Now you'd better go in and be searched. Right. See you in the morning, you fellas. Uh, right. So long. All right, Blackie. You're free to look around now. Uh, thanks, Mr. Winthrop. But I'd like to look around my way, if you don't mind. Not at all. Will you send my assistant shorty in? Yeah, right away. Thanks. 
And let me know as soon as Barnes has finished searching those three, will you? I certainly will. It'll be some time, though. We make the search very thorough. Even use a fluoroscope. Oh, uh, Shorty, you may go in now. Oh, thanks, sir. Hi, Blackie. Hey, this is some swell joint, huh? This joint's go, Shorty. Well, let's look around. Okay, boss. But for what? Oh, nothing much. Merely a clue as to how one of the three men who work in this room managed to steal a diamond almost every day without being caught. Maybe the thief swallows it. No, short one. Not that way. The suspects are put under a fluoroscope. That would detect a diamond if they swallowed it. Oh. Well, where do we start looking, Blackie? Right here. Let's see now. Where are we? Right here in the middle of the room. And what do we see? Well, I see a small safe, a workbench, and, and a door. That's the washroom, according to the sign. And I see two windows. Blackie, the windows. That's how the thief gets the diamonds out. He throws them out the window. Maybe you should have stayed home, Shorty. You know where we are? Sure, in this room. You know where this room is? It's on the 12th floor, and this side of the building faces the river. Oh. So? So I'm not so smart, huh? Anything thrown out the window would drop into the river. Now you're being a little bit smarter. Hey, what's this on the little wall here? Let's have a look, Shorty. Oh, just coat hangers. Oh, yes, and a shelf. This is where Van Hooten, Glass, and Aldrich put their lunch boxes. Lunch boxes? Yes, yeah, Shorty. They have their lunches right here. That proves the diamonds aren't taken out during the lunch hour. Hey, Blackie, that means the only time they could carry out a diamond is after work. And that's now, huh? And now they're being searched, but thoroughly. Just as they're always searched, but thoroughly. Hey, what's this thing here? Looks like a piece of corn, Blackie. I can just get it out of this crack on the floor. Eh. Ah. It is corn. Oh, I know how that got there. One of the three guys who work here had corn on a cob for lunch. Which reminds me, Blackie, I'm hungry. How much longer are we going to stay here, huh? Not much longer. I've looked the place over from top to bottom and haven't found anything. All we have to do now is wait for a report. Barnes has finished searching Van Hooten, Glass, and Aldrich, and... That should be very soon. Gee, boss, how was that guy getting the diamonds out of here? I don't know, Shorty. This mystery is everything Barnes said it would be. The diamonds can't be thrown out the window. They'd be lost in the river. And they can't be carried out because all three guys are searched. They can't be hidden in here because there's no place to hide them. Uh Uh-huh. Barnes himself figured that out a long time ago. Oh, Blackie. Oh, yes, Miss Winthrop. Has Barnes finished searching those three? Yes, he's already left. You can probably catch him if you want him, though. We found nothing on the men. The fluoroscope showed nothing on it? Not a thing. Do you know how this has been done? You've searched them and found nothing? Uh Uh-uh. You can search me. What's the trouble here? What's the trouble? All right, now, step back, all of you. Let me see here. Let me see. Ah, shot to death. What's the matter here, officer? Uh-oh. Stand back, mister. This fellow's been shot. That's Barnes. Emil Barnes from the insurance company. You know him, huh? Only slightly, officer. He was doing a little investigation for the Winthrop Jewelry Company. Oh, you don't say. He left the Winthrop Company just now, huh? Yes, and so did I. I was trying to catch up with him. But it looks like somebody caught up with him before I did. <laughs> Mr. Winthrop, I'm Faraday, police inspector. I'd like to talk to you about the murder of Emil Barnes. Of course, inspector. Hello, Faraday. Blackie, what are you doing here? Believe it or not, Faraday, I work here. That's right, inspector. Work here? Blackie, you never did a lick of work in your life. Well, I haven't done anything since I first met you. I haven't had time. I've been too busy solving your cases. Come on, come on, why are you here? He's employed here, inspector, as a diamond setter. What? It's all very simple, Faraday. Even you should be able to understand it. You're here to investigate the death of Emil Barnes, aren't you? Yes. And I suppose you know who killed him. I do. One of three men, Faraday. Van Hooten, Glass, or Aldrich. Because one of these three is stealing diamonds from the diamond setting room. Stealing diamonds? What's that got to do with Barnes? Barnes' death? Everything. Barnes was trying to find out how the diamonds were being stolen. He couldn't do it, so he asked me to try. I just started working. I suppose you've solved the case already. No, I haven't any idea how it's done. The diamond setting room is on the 12th floor facing the river, and all three diamond setters are thoroughly searched before they leave the shop. But the diamonds keep on disappearing, Inspector. Well, they do, huh? And what about today? Today, Faraday, I'll guarantee one thing. A diamond isn't missing. Blackie, 
You just guaranteed Inspector Faraday a diamond would not be missing? Well, I don't see how one could be. I don't either. But my inventory report shows that another diamond has been stolen today. <laughs> Now, back to Boston Blackie. Blackie is involved in a mystery which even he feels that he cannot solve. Three men work in a diamond setting shop from which a diamond disappears almost every day. The three men are searched every time they leave the shop, but no diamond is ever found on them. No visitors are allowed in the shop, and the only windows in the room, which is on the 12th floor, face on a river. To add to Blackie's troubles, Emil Barnes, insurance agent investigating the thefts, is murdered, obviously by one of the three suspects. As we return to our story, Blackie and Murray Wesley are in a small cafe having a midnight snack. Cheer up, Blackie. After you've had something to eat, you'll be I don't hurt. deserve to eat, Mary. I'm sure this case isn't as tough as I'm making it. If I could just find a clue. <laughs> First find something on this menu, then you can look for a clue. Oh, all right. What are you going to have? Well, I don't know. I, um... Mary, yeah. uh, I, I, I told you about Van Houten Glass and Aldrich, didn't I? Now, which one of those three might be a thief and a killer? I think better after I eat, honey child. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, what are you going to have? Uh, you eat, Mary. I don't feel like it. I have all the food I want. And it's all for thought. There's a uh, kernel of corn, hmm? for instance. Now, why in the Darling, that... you can stare at that piece of corn if you want to, but you're going to feed more than that to me. That is bird food, and I'm a growing girl. Order the biggest steak in the house. If it... Bird food. Mary, I've got it. You've got what? The answer. I know how it's done. How? What was done? Where's the telephone? Well, it's just uh, right in back of you. Come on, I'll tell you and Faraday at the same time. Well, hey, wait for me. Well, come on. Uh, uh, honey, honey, do you think it's smart to call Inspector Faraday in the middle of the night like I'm that? smart at all hours, Mary. Oh, aren't you mighty? <laughs> no, just happy. Okay. Hello? Hello, Faraday, this is Blackie. Who? Your old pal, Blackie. Wake up, Faraday. Blackie? What's the idea of calling me up? In the middle of the night? Sorry, pal, but I can't solve your cases at your convenience. What case have you solved now? Uh, you think. I know how those diamonds get out of the setting room at the Winthrop Company. Oh, you do, huh? I suppose they fly out the window. They sure do, Faraday. Did you wake me up to tell me jokes? No, Faraday. To tell you the case is solved. The diamonds fly out the window? Yes, attached to homing pigeons' legs. Uh, sure. Huh? The guy ties a diamond to the leg and the pigeon flies home. Because that's what it's trained to do. Hey, you might have something there. I think I've got the answer. Those guys aren't searched when they go into the shop, only when they go out. I know that. How does the homing pigeon get into the shop? Well, the thief brings them in in the lunchbox. And the lunchbox is empty when the guy leaves, because by that time the pigeon and the diamond have also gone out the window. Uh-huh. Look, Faraday. Yeah? I want you to come up to the shop at Winthrop's tomorrow morning early and search those lunchboxes. Okay. But what if I don't find a pigeon? Well, then I have a second plan in that case. But you'll find a pigeon, I'm sure. And when you do, the little birdie will also tell you who killed Emil Barnes. You are having trouble polishing the diamond, Mr. Jones. I may help you, perhaps. No, thanks, Van Houten. I'm getting it. Hey, Jones. Yes, Mr. Glass? What was that Inspector Faraday doing here a little while ago? I don't know. I know. Do you, Aldrich? I think he was looking through our coats and lunch boxes for a clue. What's the matter, Aldrich? Got a guilty conscience? Not especially. Not much. Boys, boys, we must not argue. It will not help anyone. If one of us is stealing the diamonds, the police will... Uh, uh, answer the phone, somebody. I'll get it. Hello? Mr. Jones, please. Just a minute. For you, Jones. Thanks. Hey, uh, now let us get to work. Hello? Mikey, this is Faraday. Oh, yes. You wanted me to look in the lunchboxes, huh? Yeah. You said I'd find a pigeon in one of them. Yes. Well, what do you think I found in those lunchboxes? What? Lunch. No. Yeah, bird brain. 
Uh, look, where are you? In the next office. Okay. I want to try one more thing. What I told you to do last night. Check? Yes. I know what I ought to do. Forget you even exist. But I guess I'll go through with the rest of your plan. When? When? Now. You go back to your workbench. Just as if nothing happened. And I'll come in and throw you out. Swell. But make it look good. Oh, don't worry. I'll be enjoying every minute of it. Goodbye. Who was that, Jones? Oh, one of the guys in the accounting office downstairs. He thinks that I... Blackie! What are you doing here? Blackie. Boston Blackie? Well, I'll be... I don't know what you'll be, Glass, but I'll be going. I'll say you will, Blackie. I told you last night to get out of this case. When you're all wrong, you're just getting in my way and... And I was just leaving, too, Inspector. So your name is Jones? Was. Spying on us, huh? Also was. We do not like spies, Mr. Boston Blackie. Uh, never mind that, Van Houten. I don't like guys who waste my time. And this guy's been wasting my time with a phony idea how those diamonds were being stolen. Now get out of here, Blackie. Get out and stay out. Okay, Faraday, you win. I was wrong. Huh? You admit it. Well, you must be sick. I am sick, Faraday. Sick of trying to help you out of jams. You get to the bottom of this your own way. I'm going someplace and get well. Oh, Blackie, I'm glad you got back to your apartment before I did. I was afraid I'd have to wait out here in the hall. I just had to look around Aldridge's house, Mary. Huh? No pigeons. What did you find out about class? He lives at 47 Eastern Street. No pigeons. Not a sign of any? Not even a feather. Then everything depends on what shorty finds at Van Houten's. Well, let's hope he finds something. He has to find pigeons, Mary. I'm sure I'm right. Because mm -hmm. if I'm not, there's no way in the world for those diamonds to disappear out of that room. Van Houten has to have pigeons or the whole... Or what? The whole... Oh, this is the slickest jewel robbery and the toughest case I've ever heard of. Uh-oh, I hope that's shorty. I hope so. Hello? Hey, Blackie, this is shorty. Yes, shorty. What did you find out about Van Houten? Well, he lives at 53 Eastern Street. 53 Eastern Street, huh? That's just a couple of doors away from where Glass lives. Yeah? Yeah, but never mind that. What did you find out about Van Houten? Nothing. I couldn't get into his place. Why not? The joint was locked. Well, did you see any pigeons in the neighborhood? Sure, Blackie, but they was all over at the church and the firehouse across the street. Not around Van Houten's. All right, Shorty. Thanks. Uh, where are you going to be? I may want to get in touch with you later. I'll be at home, Blackie. All right, goodbye. So, Van Houten had no pigeons. Shorty couldn't find out, Mary, which means that Van Houten is still a possible suspect. In fact, he's our only one. We know Glass and Aldrich don't have pigeons. Yeah, but Blackie, you know, you may be wrong entirely. You said Inspector Faraday didn't find a pigeon in any one of the three lunchboxes this morning. Oh, I have an answer to that one, Mary. Van Houten, if he's our man, was playing it smart. While the heat was on, he decided not to bring a pigeon with him. But you think maybe he'll bring a pigeon tomorrow, huh? He might. I had Faraday throw me off the case so he would figure that the heat was off. At least that's what I wanted him to figure. I'll see you later, Mary. Where are you going? To see how I can get our Holland friend, Mr. Van Houten, in Dutch. Hey, Blackie. It's miserable up here. Why didn't you tell me we was going to stand up on a roof at this hour of the morning? The janitor here told me yesterday that Van Houten kept pigeons, so we're here to watch his pigeon coat. And, Shorty, anyone with any sense would know that it'd be on the roof. I'd rather have no sense and not be here. <laughs> You've got something there, short one. Hey, what time is it? 4.30. Gee, still plenty dark. And those noises the pigeons are making, they're plenty scary. They ought to me, too. Now, stand behind that chimney here. No telling when Van Houten will come up for his pigeon. He lives downstairs, Blackie. How does he get up here on the roof? Through that door by the skylight there. Oh. Well, I better get back here behind the chimney with you, Blackie. He might be able to see me standing here. I doubt it. It's too dark. Uh, hey, look out. Don't push. Uh, sorry, Blackie. 
If you'd push a little harder, I'd be sorry and also dead. Look what's behind us. Ain't there another building next to this one? Yes. But it's a good ten-foot jump across through space to the next roof. And if you slip, it's a six-story drop through space. Oh, don't, don't talk about that, Blackie. Don't make me feel so good. Sorry. Say, uh, what are we doing Van Hooten shows? Well, Whaley gets his pigeon and grab him. Oh. Hey, Blackie, I'm smaller than you. I can sneak up without him seeing me. Let me grab him, huh? All right. But wait till he has the pigeon and then... Hey. Hmm? Look. Somebody on the roof. Shh. But where'd he come from? Through that door there. I didn't see him. We were looking the other way, talking about falling down between this building and the next. Oh. He's all by the pigeon coat. The pigeon what? Shh. Can you see what he's doing, Shorty? Yeah. He's got his arm in that pigeon thing. Coat. The coat, yeah. Now what's he doing? Well, nothing yet. Yeah. He's reaching in a cubby hole and grabbing a pigeon. Good. I grab him now, Blackie? No, no. Until he comes out. He's coming out now. Where's the pigeon? I don't see it. Guess it's in his lunchbox. Hey, he's heading for the door down into the building. We'll grab him, Shorty. Quick. Okay. Grab him. Shorty, grab him. What is this? What is this? Stay where you are, buddy. Let go of me. No, no, you don't get away from me. I do. Hey, what? Blackie's getting away. I'll say I am. Hold on, Shorty. I'm coming. And I'm coming. Hey, Shorty, that wasn't Van Hooten. That was John Glass. Come on, let's get after him. Okay, but he ain't hitting for the door. No, he's going to jump to the roof of the next building. Ah! Blackie, he didn't make it. I know. Step back, Shorty, or you may... Wow. That's the end of John Glass. Oh, gosh, Blackie, six stories down. Hey, Blackie, please stay away from that edge. Do you want to go down there after him? Yes, Shorty, I do. But I think I'll do it the long way. I'm going to walk down. Blackie, how many pigeons are there in this park? I don't know, Mary. Why? Well, uh, I want to know how many more pigeons you're going to feed before you feed me. Oh, you're not only hungry, but ungrateful, Mary. Thanks to a pigeon, I solved the most baffling jewel robbery I've ever come across. I take it all back. Uh, that John Glass certainly had a clever idea, didn't he? <laughs> a little too clever. He got the idea when he became friendly with Van Houten and saw how the homing pigeons came back from wherever he released them. He used Van Houten's pigeons to fly the diamonds back here, and Van Houten didn't know a thing about it. Say, what did he use for the pigeons to carry the diamonds in? A small round capsule. He found several of them in the uh, pigeon coat. And one with the diamond still in it. Well, that certainly proves what you already knew, didn't it? Yes, it did. Too bad Winthrop made that remark in front of Glass about Barnes, the insurance man, having the case almost solved. That's why Glass killed Barnes. Hmm. Not too bad. And Barnes was just referring to your being in on the case, wasn't he? Yes. Shame. Hey, but there's one thing I would like to know. What? Well, you worked with those three diamond setters for a whole day and a half. How'd you get away with it? You don't know anything about diamonds. Are you kidding? <laughs> I don't know anything about diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Blackie, this is the life. Alone with you in a handsome cab at 2 a.m. Who could want anything better? <laughs> the horse, maybe. He may be smart and prefer his bed to the park. <laughs> How'd you know it was 2 a.m.? I can tell by the stars. And the position of the moon. And besides, I just looked at my watch. <laughs> well, at least you've impressed our driver. Listen to him chuckle. Uh, well, I ain't impressed with her telling time or the moon and stars, son. I'm impressed because you're Boston Blackie. You see? You are, ain't you? Yes, but don't tell your horse. He might quit. 
Sergeant. And you must be Miss Wesley, ain't you, lady? <laughs> my main fault is I'm curious. Yes, driver, I'm Miss Wesley. That's my main fault, too. <laughs> and as much as it's two o'clock, Mary, I think we'd better head for the nearest exit of town. Let's get out of the park, driver. All right, Mr. Blackie. Oh, and I was just beginning to enjoy this. Wait a minute. Do I hear an organ somewhere? It's the merry-go-round over there. Oh, yes, it is. See the light shining through the trees? Yes, I do. The merry-go-round running wide open at 2 o'clock in the morning? This is crazy. Hold it, driver. Sure, sure. Oh, oh now. Oh, now. Oh, up there. Wait here a minute, driver. Come on, Mary. Let's have a look. Oh, but but I... I... The carousel shouldn't be running at this time of night. It should be closed up tight by sundown. Come on. All right. You'll wait for us, driver? Sure thing, Mr. Blackie. Sure thing. Here's a path through the hedge, Mary. Yeah, I see it. Thanks. Hey, look at the carousel. It's turning. Yeah, isn't that funny? I'll say. I wonder where the operator is. I don't know. There doesn't seem to be anybody. Mary, there's not a soul here. Nobody in sight. No, there doesn't seem to be. Now, I can't understand that, Blackie. The lights are on, the organ's playing, and the carousel is turning. And yet... Yet there isn't anyone around. Mary, I've got an idea that this merry-go-round in front of us has a mystery in back of it. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Blackie, I don't get this at all. I don't either, Mary. But it gets me. Nobody's on any of the horses. Look, look. There is a man on one of the horses. There, you see? Coming round from in back. Oh, I see him. He'll be right in front of us in a minute. Hey, you! Please. I'll jump on and wake him up. Careful, darling. Oh, don't worry. I used to hop only freight trains when I was a kid. Is the man on the horse asleep? Wait till I come around again and I'll tell you. Well, Blackie, what about the man? He's asleep. There he's The guy riding this wooden horse has a bullet in his head. <laughs> Good morning, Inspector Faraday. Uh, Good morning, Inspector. This is Blackie. Morning. Blackie. Hey, what's the idea? It's dark out. But it's still morning, pal. Three o'clock in the morning. Look, you. Can I even get a good night's sleep? Now, can you with a conscience as guilty as yours? But look, Faraday, I've got a little job for you. Well, save it for morning. By morning, I'll have it finished myself. What are you raving about, Blackie? Murder, Faraday. There's a body with a bullet in its head riding a wooden horse on the merry-go-round in the park. A body dressed in a riding habit. Blackie, you feel all right? Just fine, Faraday. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing's the matter with you at all? Not a thing. Then stop that nonsense and start talking sense. I don't blame you, Inspector, old man. It sounds ridiculous even to me. And it'll sound more ridiculous when I tell you who the corpse is. Or was. Well? John Van Dorn, the millionaire sportsman. The best-known horseman in New York, and he's found dead on a wooden horse on a merry-go-round? Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Seems silly to me, too, Faraday, but believe me, I'm serious. He's going around and around and around. Maggie, you're not kidding. I'm dead serious, comma. But Van Dorn isn't dead serious, semicolon. He's dead, period. <laughs> Yes. Good morning. Are you Peter Carson? Yes. You own the carousel in the park? Yep. I own it and I run it. What about it? I'm Boston Blackie. May I come in? Sure. Thanks. You want to know about John Van Dorn's murder, don't you? Yes, I do. You think I know something, huh? You might. What makes you think so? A little information I picked up at the park commission before I came to see you. You don't know anything about me. No? Well, I know your carousel was just about to be closed. Oh, and I know it was on a complaint from John Van Dorn that the Park Commission was going to close it. So? So you had a pretty good reason to kill Van Dorn, don't you agree? Uh, sit down. I'll tell you the little bit I know about this. You know, uh, just a little bit? Maybe you might think it's a lot. Let's hear it. 
Well, last night I... Never mind the knock on the door. Go on. Well, last night I was just... I'll talk to this guy, Blackie. Oh, good morning, Inspector. The police? Yes, Carson, but don't judge the entire force by Faraday here. He's a holdover from the days before the cops were required to think. Quiet, Blackie. Now, Carson, I'm investigating the murder of John Van Dorn. What do you know about it? Nothing, Inspector. Uh-oh. What do you mean by oh, oh, Blackie? Oh, oh, zero, zero. Nothing, nothing. Which is exactly what you're going to get out of Carson. Blackie, where are we going? To see Mrs. Van Dorn, the dead man's wife. Oh. Uh, what'd you find out from Pete Carson, the owner of the carousel? Nothing, Mary. Faraday walked in just as he was about to tell me something. Uh Uh-oh. One look at the inspector and he got locked jaw. What do you think he was going to tell you? I don't know. Somebody would tell me something. This thing's crazy, Mary. One of the city's best-known horsemen is found dead in full riding habit and riding a wooden horse. It's fantastic, all right. Fantastic. It's weird. Then Dawn died that way by coincidence, so we're dealing with a murderer with a strange sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Oh, here's Van Dorn's house. Oh, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? Van Dorn had a beautiful bank account. Beautiful wife, too. We'll soon find out. Yeah, I'm afraid of. Yes? I'd like to see Mrs. Van Dorn, please. She's not in. It's not Keto Blanc. No, it's not, but Mrs. Van Dorn is in, and so are we. All right, then. Mrs. Van Dorn... These two are here to see you. You want to see me? Yes, Mrs. Van Dorn. And if you don't mind, it's about your husband's death. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. You have to talk to my lawyer, Mr. Wilcox, about that. And where will I find him? I'm Wilcox. Well, this is easier than I thought. I'm investigating Mr. Van Dorn's death. Can you tell me anything about it, Wilcox? No, and I think you've got a lot of nerve breaking in here and talking about this unfortunate thing in front of Mrs. Van Dorn. I'm sorry, but investigations have to be made. Her husband was murdered, and I'd like to help find the killer. Are you the police? No, he's Boston Blackie, Mr. Wilcox. He's better than the police. <laughs> Not better, Mary, just luckier. Mrs. Van Dorn, you want me to find your husband's killer, don't you? Of course, but must we talk about it just now? The sooner I get the facts, the sooner the killer might be caught. That may be true, Blackie, but out of respect to the widow, I'll have to ask you to come here with your questions some other time. Some other time may be too late, Wilcox. Mrs. Van Dorn... Your husband was rather prominent socially, wasn't he? His name was well known in social and business circles, yes. How did he make his living? I understand he was quite wealthy. Oh, not terribly. He had a contract with the Jasmine Perfume Company, giving them the right to use his name on their leading brand. That was his own... Oh, must I talk about it? Everything you tell me helps, Mrs. Van Dorn. Well, I forbid any more questions, Blackie. I don't think you have much say in the matter, Wilcox. Mrs. Van Dorn. I'm her lawyer, Blackie, and I refuse to let her be questioned, by you or by anyone else. So I think you'd better leave. Here's the door. Oh, thanks. It's hard to see it when it's open like that. But I think I can find it. I'm sure you can. Come on, Mary. Oh, I'm practically out, Blackie. Oh, well. Goodbye, Wilcox. I'll see you again. Not if I can help it. You won't be able to, Wilcox. And uh, Mrs. Van Dorn, if your lawyer doesn't get off his high horse, maybe I'll never find out how your husband was killed on that wooden one. Are we driving out to meet Blackie at the merry-go-round, Inspector Faraday? No, Miss Wesley. I want to get my facts from you, alone. Oh. If Blackie were along, he'd do nothing but confuse me. Well, we'll be at the carousel in a minute. Yes, we will. It's around the bend and right down this road here, about uh, 100 yards. Yeah, yeah. That much I know. Now... Tell me just what happened when you and Blackie were riding in the park last night. Well, Blackie and I were riding along in a hansom cab. Yeah? It was uh, just about this time, about 2 a.m. As we got about here, we suddenly heard the carousel organ playing wolf, and we... Just like now. Hey, the music is playing. Yes. All right, then what happened, Miss Wesley? Well, uh, we pulled up almost in front of the merry-go-round. Like this, Miss Wesley, huh? Uh, yes, like now. And through the trees, we could see the lights of the carousel. Like... No. Hey, this is crazy. Those lights are on. And at 2 a.m. Come on, come on. Let's have a look. Right. Uh, the path to the carousel is right through this hedge here. Yeah, I see it. Come on. I'm coming, Inspector. Okay. Now, after you heard the music and saw the lights and came out here to have a look at it, just like now, then what, Miss Wesley? Well, uh, we stood here like this and watched the carousel go around and round, just like now. Yeah, and then? And then... 
All of a sudden, we noticed a body on one of the horses. Inspector! Just like now! Now, back to Boston Blackie. Blackie and Mary Wesley are riding in a handsome cab in the park at two o'clock in the morning when they find the carousel, organ playing, lights ablaze, and revolving slowly with a dead man riding one of the horses. The dead man is John Van Dorn, well-known horseman. Investigation reveals no clues nor uncovers the major suspect. That night, Faraday takes Mary out to the carousel to go over the scene of the crime, only to discover the organ playing, the lights blazing, and another dead man riding a wooden horse. As we return to our story, Faraday and Mary are standing by the carousel while Faraday's men inspect it. There's got to be fingerprints somewhere. Well, Inspector, have you got troubles? Blackie! Blackie, you get away from here. Sorry, Faraday. I must be part vulture or something. Every time I hear on my radio that a body's been found, I have to come and have a look at it. Well, look at it then, and leave. There it is, on that horse on the merry-go-round. Oh, Blackie, it's Peter Carson, the man who owns the carousel. So I see. How was he killed, Faraday? Shot, the same as Van Dorn. Uh Uh-huh, and I suppose you know why he was killed. I do. He must have seen who killed Van Dorn. Faraday, sometimes you amaze me. You're right for once. But do you know who killed him? Sure. The same guy who killed Van Dorn. Right again, Faraday. But you haven't the slightest idea who killed Van Dorn, have you? No, I thought not. All right, all right. So I'm a dope. Do you know who killed Van Dorn? <laughs> do I know who killed Van Dorn? Well, do you? Well, no. The register downstairs said Harry Wilcox's office was 1307. That must be this way, Mary. Okay, there's his door. Good, come on. Woo! That was some climb up those stairs, wasn't it? Could have been worse, Mary. This is a 36-story building, you know. Could have been better. The elevators could have been running. <laughs> Not at this hour. Hmm. Well, I suppose I'll have to pick the lock. Lucky. You sure it wouldn't be a lot easier if we just see Harry Wilcox in his office tomorrow morning? I've had one brush with Wilcox already, Mary. It's enough to let me know that the Van Dorn lawyer is not the cooperative kind. Okay. Man, that did it. And the door's open. Ladies first. Uh, when walking into a dark office, the rules are reversed. <laughs> All right. Here, you take the flashlight. Got it. You can turn it on now. I'll close the door. All right, flashlight's on. Now what? Now shine it around the room. What I'm looking for will probably be in Wilcox's safe, I hope. Mm, me too, but what if he doesn't have it safe? You say such awful things, Mary. Yeah, don't I just... Oh, there it is, Blackie. Next to that filing cabinet there. Good. It's an easy kind to open. Aren't they all to you? Bring the light over. <laughs> all right. Now what? Just hold it and be quiet. I want to hear the tumblers drop. I'll be quiet. Evelyn. Good. Shh. That's two. Better. Shh. Three. Marvelous. And open. Terrific. Aren't we now? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, let's see inside. Not much in the safe. A few uh, ledgers, a few papers. Mm-hmm. Let's hope one of those papers is what I'm looking for. Hey, what are you looking for? You'll hit me on the head if I tell you. What? You break a perfectly good flashlight? What are you looking for? I don't know. You... You don't know? No. Something. Oh, dear. Anything that could help me. Hmm? Hey. Hey, this might be interesting. What is it? Dawn's contract with that jasmine perfume firm. What contract? Contract giving them the right to use his name on their perfumes. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll have a look at this. Yeah, signed by Van Dorn and Lester Ronson, president of Jasmine. Cancellation clause, cancellation clause. Where are you? Maybe there isn't one. No. No, there isn't. But here's one just as good. A ridicule clause. A ridicule clause? What does that mean? 
It means that if Van Dorn ever did anything that might hold him up to ridicule, this contract would automatically be cancelled. Well, what would be the purpose of that, Blackie? I'm not sure, but I can guess. And my guess is that Ronson bought the Van Dorn name because it had some high society significance. In the event the name became connected with anything ridiculous, it would naturally have no value to Ronson. Well, I'm very surprised at myself, but I do understand. First thing tomorrow morning, I am going to see Mr. Ronson. Maybe he manufactures perfumes. But there's something about all this that doesn't smell so good to me. My uh, secretary says you want to see me, Blackie. What about? Oh, nothing much, Mr. Ronson. I just want to know what you know about John Van Dorn. Well, I, I don't know much. I, I merely paid him for the use of his name on my products. Yes, I know that. And, uh... Ah, I see you're turning out new bottles for your stuff, Mr. Ronson. Those nice drawings on your desk. Oh, well, these are... Uh, these are just planning roughs. Hey, I, wait a minute. I, uh, don't put those away. Seems to me the name on the label wasn't Van Dorn. Uh, it was Winston, wasn't it? Yes, yes, but that means nothing. It means something to me, Ronson. Your contract with Van Dorn was canceled by his death, wasn't it? So your perfumes are now to come out under a new name, Winston. What was wrong with Van Dorn? Well, I, I might as well tell you. you. You'll find out anyhow. The, the Van Dorn name didn't sell. Oh, so you had a contract with Van Dorn. It couldn't be canceled. His name wasn't selling your product, so you killed him. Or you'd go broke. No, no, I, I didn't kill him. But you did want to break your contract with him, didn't yes, you? Yes, but, but I, I didn't kill him. All I tried to do was involve him in a scandal so I could exercise the, the ridicule clause in my contract. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Now, now, now look, Blackie, I, I'll tell you just what I did. About time. Go on. Well, Van Dorn was a famous horseman. And I thought the city would get a good laugh if they saw him riding a wooden horse on a merry-go-round in full riding habit. That's exactly what I figured. You put him on that horse, huh? Yes, yes, I... I had him come to my house just after his daily ride in the park, and I, I drugged him. And then at midnight, I put him in my car and drove to the carousel in the park. Carried him to one of the horses and then shot him? No, no. B -b Believe me. After he was on the horse, I turned down the carousel lights and started the organ and, and put the carousel in motion. And then? And then I, I started to leave, to, to call a newspaper and give them a hot tip for a picture. Uh, society's leading horseman on a wooden horse, you know. But there was a shot. And Van Dorn slumped, and I knew the bullet had hit him. I got scared and ducked into the bushes and left. Did you see who fired the shot? No. And, and believe me, all I wanted to do was involve Van Dorn in a scandal so I could cancel my contract. All right, Ronson. That takes care of you for right now. But right now, I've got to take care of someone who wanted to cancel Van Dorn. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it's you. Yes, it's me, no, Mrs. Van Dorn. Uh, no, don't I... tell me I can't come in, because I am in. Look, now, you, you can't. Who is it, Blanche? It's that Boston Blackie again. Blackie, I thought I told you to stay away from us. Your hospitality was so charming, Wilcox, I just couldn't resist another sample. I'll give you a sample of something else if you don't get out of here. Don't make me laugh. Say, Wilcox, um, you have an office, you have a home of your own... Why is it every time I see you, you're here with Mrs. Van Dorn? Why, I Harry, could... please. It's Harry, is it? And I think you call her Blanche, don't you? Well, that happens to be her name. I know, and Blanche is the part of her name that you don't intend to change, eh? Do I hear wedding bells? Now, look here, Blackie. If you're suggesting that Harry killed my husband, that's absolutely What most... I do mean to suggest is that your husband was killed a little after midnight last night. And Wilcox, where were you at that time? At my club. Can you prove it? Yes, I can prove it. I... Oh, now who's that? I have a rough idea. Let the rough idea in, Mrs. Van Dorn. You can't keep him out. Oh, Inspector Faraday, are you back again? Come in. Thanks. Now, look, Mrs. Van Dorn. I... Blackie, what are you doing here? Same old Faraday, same old question. I've got a suspect for you. Wilcox. Wilcox? Oh, no. He couldn't have killed Van Dorn. The coroner says Van Dorn was killed sometime between midnight and two o'clock this morning. I checked and found Wilcox was in the card room at his club during those hours. Faraday, you're improving. Keep it up, and one of these days I won't even know you. Let's hope that soon. I demand you apologize to Mr. Wilcox Blackie. Okay, Wilcox. I'm sorry. But, Faraday, can I see you a moment alone? What about? 
An idea just got me that may get you a murderer. I hope you aren't afraid in the park so late at night, Mrs. Bendorn. It is rather dark and frightening, isn't it, Blackie? Yes, it is. Oh, here's the path I want. Where are we going? To the merry-go-round, Mrs. Van Dorn, if you don't mind. No. Why should I? Well, I thought you wouldn't mind seeing it. If it could help find your husband's killer. Ah, oh, here we are. Awfully quiet out here, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. You know, Mrs. Van Dorn, when I get off to any place like this where it's quiet, my mind plays awfully strange tricks on me. Sometimes I... <laughs> Well, I even seem to see things that aren't there. Oh? Psychiatrists would say that it was my subconscious mind working, I suppose. Uh, yes, it's very interesting. For instance, last night I was standing in front of this carousel. The lights were blazing. They were? Yes, the lights were on. And... Oh, Blackie, look. Look, Mrs. Vendorn? At what? The lights of the carousel are on. I don't see them. But you must. Every light is on. Every light. No, Mrs. Vendorn. You're imagining. No, it, I'm not. The lights are on. The lights aren't on, Mrs. Vendorn. But they are. Where, and, and the merry-go-round is turning. At two o'clock in the morning? How could that be? Well, it is. And, it, and there's the music. Can you hear that? You, you do hear no, it, don't you? No, no, I don't, Mrs. Vendorn. Don't listen. The music is playing. Now, look, the merry-go-round is turning. Mrs. Vendorn, control I yourself. I see it. I see it. I tell you, and I hear it. It was just like this when I followed Mr. Ronson out here. Mrs. Vendorn. I stood here. I stood here and watched. He put John on the horse. And the carousel went around, it went around. And when John came around one time, I shot him. I shot him. Mrs. Van Dorn, you don't He know was riding that wooden horse up and down, up and down. There he is again. Just like he was then. All right, Faraday. You can get off that wooden horse. She talks. <laughs> Alone with you here at two o'clock. Oh, Blackie, this is the life. Oh, no, Mary, this is the park. Oh, you silly. And the last time we came here, we got mixed up in a murder. And how we were mixed up. And Blackie, I still don't know why the carousel owner was killed. Well, Mrs. Van Dorn murdered the carousel owner because she thought he might have seen her shoot her husband. And he might have at that. Oh, but now, wait a minute. Let's go back a little bit farther. How did Mrs. Van Dorn know Ronson was bringing her husband out here in the first place? Her husband had called her from Ronson's, and when he didn't show up along about midnight, she went over there. She saw Ronson carrying her husband out and followed him. Well, if she saw that, why didn't she tell it to the police afterward? Because, my dear, she was a killer, and she felt the less said, the better. Blackie. Like the music's playing again. I know. But, but it's, it's... I know. It's two o'clock again, but it's not two o'clock in the morning, Mary. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh. Oh. Blackie. Let's go on the merry-go-round. Just you and I. Well, Please. all right, Mary. But why? Um, uh, why? Um, Why? Well, I don't know exactly. Oh, yes, I do. Maybe it's because I want people to say that we're going around together. You see? See what you're complaining about, John? Oh, you don't, huh? Well, who owns this pawn shop, Paul? You, me, or both of us? We both do, you know that. Okay, then. From now on, I sign checks the same as you do. Now, wait a minute, John. You're getting your share of the profits, aren't you? So you say. Only I don't trust you. I'll get it. Hello. Hello. Wait a minute, this. Is anybody on here? 
Hello. Hello. Is this Blaine's pawn shop? Yeah, what do you want? Uh, I want to speak to Paul Blaine, please. Oh, you don't care who you speak to, do you? Just a minute. It's for you here. Thanks. Hello? Hello, Paul Blaine? Yeah? This is Boston Blackie. Uh, you wanted me to call you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm sorry about the way my brother spoke to you on the phone. We're having a little argument. That's all right. Uh, what do you want, Blaine? I'd, I'd like to see you. It's important. And, uh, well, could you get down here this afternoon? Well, I don't know. I... Uh, no, look, you got to come. It's awfully important. All right, Blaine. I'll be there about 3 o'clock. Okay, 3 o'clock. Uh, thanks. Goodbye. Hey, what kind of a deal you got cooking with Blackie, Paul? That's my own business. Now, look, John, I don't want any more trouble with you or... Oh, no, well, you're going to get it. Now, wait a minute, John. Don't leave. Stop worrying about my leaving. But just start worrying if I come back. <laughs> And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Oh, there's the pawn shop we want. Two doors down, Mary. Oh, yeah. Why did Paul Blaine want to see you, Blackie? I don't know, Mary. That's what I've come down here to find out. Well, that being the case, let's go in and find out. Here we are. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you Paul Blaine? Yes, I am. You must be Boston Blackie. Yes, and this is Mary Wesley. How, How do you, you do, Mr. Blaine? Well, you're right on time, Blackie. You said you'd be here at three, and it's, well, two minutes of three right now. I'm generally on time, Blaine. What do you want to see me about? Well, it's this, Blackie. I made a loan of $1,000 on a diamond yesterday, and this morning I found out it's stolen property. Uh-oh. That's bad, isn't it? It's very bad, Miss Wesley. It means I may lose my $1,000. Ooh. Well, what do you want me to do about it, Blaine? Well, I... I thought you'd take the diamond to the insurance company that carries a policy on it and make a deal so I could get my money back. Oh. Well, I suppose I could do that, but why can't you? Well, they'd have no reason to bargain with me. They'd know I'd have to turn in the diamond to the police. And Well, I was hoping it wouldn't be too much trouble for oh, you to... Oh, Blackie's so used to trouble, he's lonesome without it. Quiet, Mary. All right, but uh, I like that. That's what I like, modesty. Mm -hmm. All right, Blaine, I'll take the diamond. Oh, thanks, thanks a lot. Here, I have it here in my pocket. Okay, Blaine. Ooh. You'll hear from me tomorrow. Uh, about what time, Blackie? Mm, same time as now, 3 o'clock. Come on, Mary. Uh, okay, okay, see you at 3 tomorrow, Blackie. Goodbye, and thanks. Goodbye, and don't mention it. Let's wait here for care, Mary. All right. Blackie, will you be able to get Mr. Blaine's thousand dollars back? I think so, Mary. All I have to do is... That was a shot! And inside the store, too. Come on. Blaine! Blaine, where... Oh, there he is. Blackie, it's... Oh. Oh, it, it looks like he's... Dead, Mary. Ooh. He has to be dead unless he was wearing a bulletproof heart. Yes, but, but who could have... I don't know. But whoever it was is probably out the back way by now. Well, here we go again. I guess I'd better call Faraday. No, darling, no. Please don't call Inspector Faraday. You didn't have anything to do with this, but Faraday will never believe you. All right, Mary, I guess the best way for us to stay out of this is to get out of here. Hey, Rollins! Rollins, come in my office! Yeah, Inspector Faraday? What about some action on the murder of Paul Blaine, the pawnbroker? Inspector, there hasn't been a thing developed. Oh, just a minute. Faraday speaking. Inspector, got a little news for you. You want to know who killed Paul Blaine, don't you? Sure. Do you know who did it? Well, I know who was in his store about the time he got bumped. Oh. A friend of yours, Boston Blackie. A friend of it? Bo Hello. Hello. What was it, Inspector? Some guy who says Boston Blackie was at the scene of Paul Blaine's murder. Good. I mean, that's exactly what you want, isn't it? It should be, but it isn't. This is one time I don't think Blackie's involved. And besides, I waste too much time chasing that guy anyway. Gee, Inspector, you must be sick. Maybe that call was a straight tip. I doubt it. Besides, I got a line on Blaine's killer. Yeah, who? Never mind who. But Blaine sent a certain guy to prison about five years ago. Last week, that certain guy got out of prison. I think he killed Blaine for revenge. Could be, Inspector, but I'd still like to have a look around Blackie's apartment. Go ahead. Waste your time any way you want. But I'll bet I find a real killer before you find anything on Boston Blackie. <laughs> Nothing, nothing, honey. Something is, honey. You seem awfully upset. What is the matter? 
You read the paper you brought me? Only the headline. I don't remember what they said, though. Well, let me refresh your memory just a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, listen to this headline. Huh. Cops looking for ex-convict and Blaine murder. Oh, yes, I remember that. Well, I'm an ex-con, remember that? Yes, of course, darling. You got out of jail, let's see. It was last, uh... What day was it? Last Friday. Oh, yes, that's right. But, darling, what does this have to do with you and then this Mr. Blaine's murder? Well, Blaine sent me to prison. Now the cops are trying to tie me up with his murder. Oh. Hmm. The paper says Blaine was knocked off at 3 o'clock yesterday. If I could... Just remember where I was then, I... Don't you know where you were, Harry? You were with me. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, but where? Uh, we weren't anywhere. We were out walking, that's all. Oh, yes, that's right. Where were we walking? Do you remember? Oh, not exactly. Downtown somewhere. Hmm. No, I've got to keep you out of this. I think I know what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to see a fellow named Boston Blackie. He helps guys like me. Well, you can't leave here if the police are looking for you. Harry, I've met Blackie's friend, Mary Wesley. I know her. I'll get her to help me, and she'll get Blackie to help you. Now, Helen, please, can't you remember where you and Harry were and, and at least about what time it was? No, Mary, I can't. All I know is is that we were out walking. Yes, but where, dear? Just downtown. That's a big help. Oh. Now, look, Paul Blaine was murdered at 3 o'clock in a shop on 71st Street. Were you on 71st Street around 3 o'clock? Well, no. <sighs> oh, gosh, I'm beginning to sound like Blackie. Mary, I don't know where we were. I started out to see a man about fixing my coat. I think I have his address here in my purse. Oh, now, well, this might be minute. something. Oh, dear. Oh, yes. Here's his address. 20th Street. All right, now you think you were on 20th Street. Yes. Down there somewhere. But I don't know. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that other card in your purse? Where? Which one? Oh, yes, it's this. Oh, yes, I remember. A sidewalk photographer took our picture and gave us this check. Yesterday? Yes, while we were out walking. Yesterday afternoon. Hmm. Well, as Blackie might say when I show him this, it's a nice photograph. Let's hope it doesn't result in any negative development. Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Rawlins. I'm calling from Blackie's apartment. And guess what I found? Guess. Guess? What am I? A guest star? What was it? A diamond. So what? Well, this diamond is listed as one of the things which should have been in Paul Blaine's pawn shop, but wasn't. Yeah? Yeah. And that means maybe Blackie... was... Well, he, uh... He, uh, might have... Uh... What are you talking about? Well, uh, you see, uh... <laughs> I get it. Blackie slipped up behind you and has a gun in your back, huh? <laughs> Some cop you are. Uh, just put Blackie on the phone. Sure. Here, Blackie, he wants to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, Rollins. And uh, don't go away yet. Okay. Hello, Inspector. Blackie, what is that diamond from Blaine's pawn shop doing in your apartment? It's all very simple, Inspector, but it'll sound complicated to you. Blaine gave it to me. Oh, yeah? When? At 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. 3 o'clock? That's when we think he was killed. And I got to tip you were there when it happened. Only I didn't believe it. Why not? I was there. A few minutes before and after the murder. What? And you didn't report it? No, Faraday. And you know why, too. It meant getting mixed up in this, which is something I didn't want to do. I didn't believe the tip I got. And I'll tell you something you won't believe. What? I believe you. How do you like that? Faraday, my, how you've changed. Uh, never mind about me. You sent Rollins back to headquarters. And with that diamond. All right. Bye. Goodbye. Rollins. Yeah, Blackie? Faraday wants you back at headquarters, and you can take this diamond with you. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Blackie. Good, uh... Oh, hello, Miss Wesley. Hello, Sergeant Rollins. Come in, Mary. The sergeant is just leaving. Yes, yeah, so long. Bye. Well, Mary, I almost got mixed up in the Blaine murder. Rollins found that diamond Blaine gave me, and Faraday got a tip I was there when Blaine was killed. Oh, somebody's trying to frame you. Well, that means you'll help my friend Helen, doesn't it? What? What friend Helen? Helen Waltham, darling. The one I told you about on the telephone. 
Faraday thinks her fiancé, Harry Matthews, murdered Blaine. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, that means I... I'd better find an alibi for Matthews that will show him away from the scene of the crime at the time of the murder. Well, all right, then. I know this much, Blackie. Yesterday afternoon, Helen and Harry were walking on 20th Street. Now, that's about five miles from the scene of the crime. A sidewalk photographer took their picture, she thinks about three o'clock, and she had a receipt for it. I took that. Here. Picture, huh? Say, I'd like to see it. Maybe the shadows on the street or something on it would give Matthews an alibi. Yeah. It's awfully late. The photoshop is probably closed by now. But if we can get into the dark room, maybe we can bring an alibi for Matthews out into the light. <laughs> How soon will the picture be developed, Blackie? Should be about now, Mary. I've got the print and the solution about... Uh... Oh, I'm beginning to see something now. Good. I'm glad you took this claim check from Helen so we could find this picture. Hmm. It's about been that printed and taking as long as it took us to get in here. That was a tough lock on mm-hmm. the door, Mary. You had a hard time picking it. Yeah, you'll have to buy the photographer a new lock, won't you? <laughs> I suppose so. Now let's hope this picture shows something that'll help us. All we know now is that it was... Taken the afternoon of the murder. Okay, I'm hoping. Look, Blackie, there's the whole picture now. It's clear, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Now we'll lift it out of the solution and have a look at it. Here, I'll put it on the table here and hold it down with these weights so it won't curl while it dries. There. Well, it shows Helen and her friend Matthew's all right. Look behind Helen and our boyfriend, Mary. The Leeds Jewelry Store clock and look at the time. Three o'clock. And Leeds Jewelry Stories on 20th Street a good five miles from where Paul Blaine was killed. And at three o'clock. Tell your friend Helen not to worry, Mary. Our friend Harry Matthews is all right. The clear shot of the clock in this picture put him in the clear, too. Now, back to Boston Blackie. Paul Blaine, pawnbroker, gets Blackie's help in returning a stolen diamond. Just after Blackie leaves him, however, Blaine is shot and killed. Police think Blaine was murdered by Harry Matthews, ex-con, who was sent to jail by Blaine. But with the help of his girlfriend, Helen Waltham, Matthews receives Blackie's help in proving his innocence. Blackie finds a sidewalk photographer's picture of Matthews near the Leeds jewelry store five miles away from the murder scene with the hands of the clock at three, which is the time Blaine was killed. So Matthews is obviously innocent. As we return to our story, Mary Wesley is at the Leeds jewelry store. And what can I do for you, miss? I'm not sure. Uh, Are you Mr. Leeds? Yes, I am. Well, um, this may sound sort of silly, but... I'd like to know about that big clock out in front of your store. I hope you don't want to buy it. Oh, no, no. I just would like to know how accurate it is. Oh, it's the most accurate clock in town, miss. We have it checked once a week. It loses hardly a second. I see. When was the check last? Uh, why, uh, four days ago. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Where's the nearest public phone? Oh, if you want to use a phone, you may use mine right there on the desk. Thank you. Oh, that's quite all right. Blackie, this is Mary. You find out about the clock? Yes, it's always right, and it was checked four days ago. Good. Now I'm absolutely sure Matthews is innocent. I'm going up to tell him for two reasons. To make him happy and Faraday miserable. All right, Matthews. You might as well talk. I didn't come to your apartment to outstay you. I don't have anything to talk about, Inspector Faraday. You killed Paul Blaine, so you ought to have a lot to talk about. I didn't kill him, Inspector. I I admit I had a reason. He sent me to jail, but I didn't kill him. That's what they all tell me. Until I prove they're lying. Who's that at the door? One of your pals, Matthews? I don't know who it is. Well, go answer it. But no tricks. Don't worry. I don't have anything to hide. Is this Harry Matthews' apartment? Yes, I'm Harry Matthews. Blackie, for Pete's sake, what are you doing here? Just playing newsboy. Good newsboy, I might say. Blackie, I didn't kill Blaine. Don't let this guy arrest me. Don't worry, Harry. I wouldn't let Faraday do anything he'd be sorry for. Look, what do you mean, I'd be sorry? 
Harry here is the one who's going to be sorry. He's going to jail. Is he? When was Blaine killed? At three o'clock yesterday. You know that. All right. Take a look at this. What is it? A picture of Harry and his girlfriend walking down 20th Street a good five miles away from the scene of the crime. Taken yesterday, too. There's a date on it. Look. I am looking. So what? So look at the clock behind them. What time does it say? Well, I'll... It says three o'clock. That's right. And do you know what time it is now, Faraday? Huh? What's that it's got to do... It's time you apologized to an innocent man and got out of here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Matthews. Yeah, okay. And um, Blackie, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Mm. Thanks, Blackie. You're a big help to me. You've just cost me my only suspect. Don't fret, Faraday. What I take away, I usually put back. I've got another one for you. Come on, Harry. I'd like you to drive me down to see him right now. This is Blaine's pawn shop right here, Harry. Thanks for driving me. Uh, no, no trouble, Blackie. It was nice seeing you, Blackie. Thanks, Helen, and thanks for the lift. Okay. Oh, say, would you wait for me for a few minutes? I'm going to want to get to my bank and... I may not be able to get a car. Sure, sure, we'll wait. But you better hurry. The bank closes in a few minutes. I guess I shouldn't have stopped to pick up Helen. That's all right. We'll make it. How far do you bank? Seven on 25th Street. The Weatherly National, Blackie? Yes, Helen, why? Why, that's my bank, too. <laughs> well, we're practically partners, then, Helen. <laughs> yeah. I'll be out in a minute. You want me to go with you? No, thanks, Matthews. I like to do things like this alone. Be right back. Hurry, or you'll be too late to get to the bank. All right. Good afternoon. Yeah? What's good about it? Well, that's fine talk. You own this shop? I'm John Blaine, if that's what you mean. I'm Boston Blackie. Hooray. So you're Boston Blackie. So what? So I'd like to talk to you. Maybe about the killing of your brother. What makes you think I killed him? You were having an argument when I called up yesterday afternoon and spoke to your brother. So what? So an argument could end in a killing. So could too much curiosity. Get out of here, Blackie. Fast. Now, is that a nice way to do business, John? Your brother Paul never pulled a gun on a visitor. Get out of here, I said. When I'm finished. You're finished now. Get out of here. Maybe this will help you move. You missed me, my friend. Or should I wait till I try to turn my head? I missed you because I wanted to. But next time, maybe I won't want to miss. I wish I'd known you were having trouble with John Blaine, Blackie. I could have run out and given you a hand. I didn't mind arguing with him, Harry. It was the back talk from his gun I couldn't do anything about. Blackie, I want to thank you for helping Harry out of his trouble. Well, he's not out completely yet, Helen. What? He isn't, Blackie. Why isn't he? Oh, it's nothing to get excited about. I just wasn't able to prove John Blaine is a 100% suspect. And until I do, Faraday will always feel like Harry here is guilty. Well, as long as you believe I'm innocent. You're safe. Even Faraday has, has to face the facts. You couldn't have killed Blaine. You're too far away from the scene of the murder when Blaine was killed. Oh, say, it's too late for me to get to the bank, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is. Oh, dear, that's a shame. It is after three o'clock, isn't it? Slightly. Say, do either of you have enough money to cash a check? If it isn't too big? Well, all I've got is five. How about you, Helen? No, I don't think I... Oh, wait, I might have some. Yes, I... Why, yes, of course I do. Swell, could you spare 50, Helen? Fifty? I don't... Oh, what? Oh, dear, what's the matter with me? I drew a hundred out of the bank yesterday. You did? Yes, it was yesterday. I remember I got to the bank just at closing time, and I had to argue with the man at the door to let me in. Here's the money you wanted, Blackie. Oh, how much did you ask for? Just fifty. Oh, yes. Forty... Fifty. Here. You can make a check out later. All right, thanks. That's all right. I could give you more if you wanted it. No, thanks. You've given me plenty already. Hmm. That sidewalk photographer must have a mania for putting fancy locks on his door. <laughs> this one's tougher than the one I picked yesterday, Mary. Yeah, it sure seems to be. But what are we going to find by breaking into this dark room again? Oh, nothing much, Mary. Just this. How Helen Waltham could have been with Harry Matthews in front of Leeds Jewelry Store having a picture taken at 3 o'clock yesterday and still be in her bank at closing time. 
That's three o'clock. I know it's my bank, too. There, that opened the lock. Good. But about the time, that's impossible, darling. The clock on Leeds Jewelry Store is never wrong. I know it. But why would Helen say she was in her bank at closing time if she wasn't? She was very definite about that. Yeah, I know. So you said. Come on. Let's go into the dark room. I'm going to take a look at that picture again. All right. Wait, I'll turn on the light. There. Blackie, you think the picture of Harry and Helen was faked? We touched or something? No, it wasn't. I would have noticed it. The picture was real. The clock wasn't wrong. So there's only one answer to this whole thing. What? I said there's only one answer, Mary. I didn't say I knew what it was. Oh. Let's see. Do you remember the number of that picture of Harry and Helen? I sure do. 4121. Uh, uh, yeah. Here's the index file. 4121. 4121. Where is that? Oh, here we are. Mm-hmm. It's a legitimate picture, all right. So where are we? Right back where we started. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Oh, wait a minute. I've got a hunch. This is picture 4121. Let's have a look at picture number 4120 and see what that looks like. Well, what do you think that'll show? Well, I don't know. That's why I want to look at it. 4120, 4120. Ah, here it is, already developed. Yeah, taken at the same spot. That's good. Let me look at it, too. A picture of a woman and a little girl. Well, that's not much. But, Mary, look at the clock behind them. For goodness sake, there's a man on a ladder doing something to it. Yes, looks as if he's cleaning it. And look, Mary, look at the time. It's 3.30. 3.30? B- yes. And do you know what that means? It means the picture was taken before picture number 4120, and yet the clock says 3.30. So picture number 4121, showing Harry and Helen, had to be taken after 3.30. Blackie. Then Harry could have killed Paul Blaine. He not only could have, Mary, but he probably did. That guy on the ladder there is obviously Harry's accomplice. He was planted to set back the clock so that Harry could have an alibi when his picture was taken. Wow. Wow is right. So it was Harry and not John Blaine, after all. I should have known John acted too guilty to be guilty. Come on. It's going to hurt to do this, but I've got to call Faraday and tell him that he was right about Matthews. It's a lovely day for a walk, isn't it, Blackie? Beautiful, Mary. Is that beautiful, Mary, or beautiful Mary? (laughs) Take your choice. (laughs) Well, I've taken it, and so I thank you, kind sir. Hey, Blackie. Yes? Why did Harry Matthews call Inspector Faraday and tell him you were at the scene of Paul Blaine's murder? Oh, that's easy, Mary. Two reasons. He wanted to involve me, and he... Wanted to make sure the police established the time of the murder at 3 o'clock so his alibi with the fixed-up clock would stand up. He probably was hiding in the back of the pawn shop while we were talking to Paul Blaine the day of the murder. Oh, I see. That guy Matthews was clever, Mary. He never once offered an alibi. He knew it would be too phony if he did. He waited for me to supply it for him, and I did, by discovering that sidewalk photographer's picture. Yeah, he was clever, all right. He killed Paul Blaine for revenge, didn't he? But uh, he made one mistake, you know. Hmm? He didn't go to the trouble to find out where his friend Helen was at exactly three o'clock. No, thanks to her, we broke the case. I certainly was glad Faraday didn't involve her. Harry was obviously just using it. Here you are, lady. Blackie, did you see what just happened? What? A sidewalk photographer just snapped our picture. Well, how do you like that? Why does everything happen to us? Well, I don't know, but it certainly does. Blackie, tell me, how do sidewalk photographers like this fellow know whose picture to take? How? Why, Mary, that's simple. Snap judgment, that's all. Just snap judgment. Oh. <laughs>
laundry, see? Right through that door is the prison arsenal. All that stands between us and the arsenal is that guard and that door. Stop talking too much and let's get going. Shut up. And the rest of you guys stop staring at me. The guard's looking this way. And we're sunk if he thinks we're talking. Okay, okay. Now get this. Red is at the dryer by the door. As soon as the guard's back is turned, he's going to let him have it at the handle off the drying machine. Smith, you get the keys off the guard. Open the door and we'll be on our way in ten seconds. Now we've got... Oh, Red, Red, get the guard. Come on, come on. Get that door open, Smith. Get it open. It's open, but it's out. They lost. Come on. Let's get to the arsenal before the guard can get to us. Come on, we're getting out of here. And we're getting out of this jail. Come on, there they go out the side door at the arsenal. They must have killed the guard there. I hope not. I'm going to let them have it. Hold it. Hold it. We got him ducking in the cell block, eh? Good. We get them bottled in there, they'll never get out. Yeah. Hey, Harry, look. There goes one of them over the east wall. It's Mike Harlan, I think. Come on, let's go after him. Never mind. The guard's the east wall to take care of him. We can stay here. Get in there. Hey, there's the phone. Get it, will you? Okay. Hello. Guard 66. What? Okay, thanks. Who was that, John? Base call, Harry. We got a bottle up in block A. Everything's under control. But that guy going over the east wall got away. He did, huh? Who was it? Did they know? Yeah, it was Mike Harlan, Harry. One of the guys who was a guest of ours, thanks to Boston Blackie. <laughs> And now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Police headquarters. Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, I think I might know something you'd like to know. Yeah? Who's this? That ain't important. But my information is. Mm. What's important about it? Mike Harlan busted out of prison yesterday, didn't he? And you're looking for him, ain't you? Yeah, sure, I'm looking for him. Well, I think I know where you can grab him. Yeah? Where? Boston Blackie sent him to jail, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, so what? So I figure that's where Mike Harlan is heading. We'll settle a little score as soon as the heat on him dies down. What makes you think so? A couple of minutes ago, I saw him hiding in an alley two blocks from where Blackie lives. Yeah? Well, why are you telling me this? I don't like Harlan. Yeah, well, if... Hello! Hello! No, he would hang up. Rollins! Rollins! Yes, Inspector? Get me a squad car, quick. We're getting out to Boston Blackie's fast. <laughs> Open up! I tell you, Inspector, there's nobody in there. Maybe nobody alive. Come on, come on. We're going to break down the door. Okay. All right. Come on, shove. <clears throat> Again, shove. <clears throat> One more ought to do it, Inspector. Okay, together now. Hard. <clears throat> Did it. Come on, Robbins. Come on, where, Inspector? There's nobody in here. I got eyes. Maybe Blackie's in another room. Maybe. Come on. Let's try this room in here. Okay, but I hope we're not too late. So do I. Blackie, are you in here? Blackie. Hello, Inspector. You know Mike Harlan here. Harlan? Inspector, Harlan's got a gun on him. All right, Harlan. Grab that gun before I drop you. Drop it! Okay, copper. Drop that gun, I said. How's that, copper? Suit you okay? Yeah, now don't move. Get his gun, Rollins. I've got him covered. Right. Go ahead and play, children. I'm enjoying this. No, keep him covered, Rollins, while I get his gun. Uh. Proud of yourself, my copper? Yeah, sure. I'd probably get a tin whistle for this. It was so hard to do. Take him in, Rollins. Get him out of here. All right. Too bad I didn't get to finish the job, Lucky. But I may be back. So long. Goodbye, Harlan. Too bad you couldn't stay longer. Well, Faraday. Well, Blackie. Well, what do you want me to do, Faraday? Kiss your hand? No, but you might say thanks. Thanks to a telephone tip from one of Harlan's old enemies. I just got here in time to keep Harlan from killing you. Oh, that's right, you did. What do you mean, that's right, I did? Didn't I bust in here and catch him holding a gun on you? Yes, you did, Faraday, and thanks right. a lot. All right. I'll do the same for you sometime. And thanks for getting here so fast. Holland wasn't here five minutes before you broke in. Look, I didn't come up here to save your life. I came up here to capture an escaped criminal. 
Too bad I had to do both at the same time. Hey, how did he happen to get a gun on you, eh? Jealous, Faraday? You should be. Come to think of it, you've never been able to get anything on me. Well, Mary, Faraday is now under the impression he saved my life. Though I guess I do owe him something at that. So do I, Blackie. And for the same reason. Weren't you wondering why I was a little late calling for you? Oh, at first I thought you had trouble getting this cab, but after all, you were only an hour late. That's practically on time for you. You didn't really mind, did you? I didn't, but the doorman did. I was outside so long, I made 35 cents on tips opening taxi doors. I'd want my cut, but uh, I'm too pleased with the way you look tonight. I do not look any differently tonight. Maybe it's that dress you're wearing. No, is it? Not particularly. I got it this afternoon. It's all of five hours old. Doesn't look its age, does it? Well, it's just my size, so there isn't room for a wrinkle. <laughs> Tell me why you're wearing an evening gown, Mary. Listen, my blackie, and you shall hear. This afternoon, you called to say you were taking me to a very lovely place tonight. It is now tonight. I am dressed appropriately for the very lovely place. Now, the place isn't that lovely. Well, thank you. You're being extra special sweet tonight, darling. You wouldn't have a reason, an extra special reason, by any chance. Or oh, Mary, how can you even think such a oh, thing? Oh, that's all I wanted to know. All right, out with it. The deal to drive uptown for dinner is all off, huh? Oh, I'd say it was, well, uh, postponed temporarily. You know, that's what I like about us. Plan subject to change without notice. Too bad this dress isn't. The dress is very attractive, Mary. Well, inasmuch as it's becoming increasingly apparent that I am due for a disappointment, you'll have to do better than that. Try again. Oh, very well. The dress is... Oh, it isn't that good. On the contrary. What there is of it is terrific. Well, then you should have made the whistle shorter, like this. <laughs> <laughs> And now I hate to be inquisitive, but where are we going? To a place downtown known as the Traveler's Barn. The Traveler's Barn? What's that? Believe me, it's all to your credit that you don't know. It's a combination place, joint, and dive. But I've got to go there tonight. Oh, all right, darling. Only I won't say I'm not disappointed. In fact, there's only one thing that could possibly make this situation worse. What's that? If you were going to the Traveler's Barn to meet another girl... Funny you should mention that, Mary. That's exactly why I'm going there. To meet another girl. You know something, Blackie? If you didn't tell me, and if I kept my eyes closed, and if I couldn't smell anything, uh, and if I couldn't hear anything, I'd swear we were at the Cartman instead of the Traveler's Barn. <laughs> Mary, I think you're a snob. The Traveler's Barn has only the finest red and white checkered tablecloths. Too bad I don't feel like playing checkers. <laughs> I wouldn't want to play anything with the mob in here. Take a look. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, I'll be happy if they stop looking at me. Darling, must we stay here? This place gives me the creeps. We won't have to stay much longer. I pointed out the girl I came down to see, didn't I? Yeah. She's very attractive, too. Uh-huh. And you'd see how young she was if she'd scrape some of that war paint off her face. Anyhow, I can't go over to see her until that character there leaves. I'll put a whammy on him right now. Whammy. Whammy. How long do your whammies take before they work? Well, that all depends on how much on the job my private genie is. Of course, right now I think he's probably out to dinner. It's just my luck. Well, at least you're feeling better. That's something. I suppose. But hey, wait a minute. Suppose the young lady you came down here to see won't talk to you. Have you ever known a girl who wouldn't? <laughs> for the sake of your conceit, no answer to that one. <laughs> but you say you wanted to do something for you. What if she won't? Have you ever known a girl who wouldn't? Present company accepted. <laughs> well... Don't answer that. Hey. Hey, the whammy's working. What do you know? That man just left the girl's table. Wonderful. I hope your genie had a fine meal. You Thank him for me when you talk to him again. <laughs> okay, I will. Now, you go over there and show me how good you are. Right. Excuse me, please. I'll excuse you. But if coming down here doesn't do you any good, I'll never forgive you. I'll remember that. 
Hello. Are you Gladys Holland? Could be, Hanson. Mind if I uh, sit down? I don't, but Joe might. Only he doesn't happen to be around right now. I imagine that's an invitation. And if it is, it's accepted. Thanks. Hey, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Now, that's a purely masculine line, Miss Harlan. You know, uh, I beg your pardon, Miss, but haven't I seen you somewhere before? The Riviera, perhaps, or Biarritz, or Cannes? I have seen you somewhere, and I've heard you talk, too. Is that important? It could be, just in case. Well, just in case I ever wanted to get in touch with you. What about this uh, Joe fellow? The one who might object to my sitting here with you if he happened to be around right now. He's still head man. Ah, <laughs> you're not that good, Hanson. Not this fast, you're not. Who are you? Boston Blackie. Boston? So that's why you look familiar. I should have remembered your face. I've hated it long enough. I've got to talk to you. Sure, sure, but I don't have to listen. You sent my old man to the pen, Blackie. Beat it now before you give this place a bad name. Well, what's keeping you here? If you remember me, Gladys, you also remember that I pretty nearly always do the things I set out to do. Sure, I remember that. You set out to send my father to jail, and you did. Well, what do you want from me? Congratulations. If I hadn't sent him there, Gladys, someone else would have. Yeah? Well, I... Everything okay here? Yeah, Joe, I can handle myself. Okay, Val. I want to see you in my office as soon as you're through. Yeah, Joe, right away. Look, Gladys, I want to talk to you. Go ahead. Make with the monologue. All right. Will you do something for me? Sure. Let's kill you for sending my old man to jail. Look, forget about your father for a minute. I happen to know you're heading for jail yourself if you don't get out of this gang you're running around with. I don't know what you're talking about. But I do. And I want to do something about it. You do, huh? What do you want to do? Send me to jail, too? Ah, oh, get lost, you... And I guarantee no one will ever go looking for you. Now, back to Boston Blackie. Mike Harlan, sent to jail by Blackie, makes a successful prison break and heads straight for Blackie's apartment. Inspector Faraday gets a tip that Harlan is at Blackie's and gets there just in time to find Harlan holding a gun on Blackie. Harlan is returned to jail. And that night, Blackie takes Mary to a waterfront dive, the Traveler's Barn, to see Gladys, Mike Harlan's daughter, who has joined an underworld gang. He tries to get her to do something for him, but she won't even speak to him. As we return to our story, Blackie is in Mary's apartment trying to find a way to talk further to the escaped convict's daughter. Blackie, why do you even bother thinking about Gladys after the way she treated you? Because she's not half as tough as she pretends to be. She's just in with a bad lot and thinks it's smart to do the things they do. Has she been with them long? No. That's why I've got to stop her before it's too late. Yes, but look, darling. How do you even know she's mixed up with the game? Isn't it obvious? Oh, yeah, I suppose it is. So you better tell me. Not now. But I happen to know that Joe character and his gang are about to pull something soon. If I only knew what it was and where. Well, why don't you call Gladys up and ask her? <laughs> That's a good idea. I'm silly. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> what? What are we laughing at? That's a good idea. Get the phone book. Look up Gladys Hall. Oh. Well, all right, but I don't get it. How are you going to get it to talk to you? Like this. Hey, is everything okay here, Dal? Who are you imitating now? Joe, the owner of the barn. And obviously also Gladys' boss. Oh, here it is. Oh, I see what you're going to do. Let's just hope she's home and this works. Got a number? Mm-hmm. H-A-1-2-1-3-8. And kindly forget it immediately after you dial, too. Now, I wonder why you said that. Hmm. Uh, Blackie, that Joe person has a little black mustache. Don't you wear a mustache when you talk to her? Aren't you a big help? The phone's ringing. There he goes. My fingers are crossed. You really on my side? Cross my heart. Your fingers and your heart. Kind of a double cross, isn't it? Mm. Hello? Hey, Dal. Is everything okay? Oh, it's you, Joe. Sure, why, yes. Well, I was just wondering, see? 
You sure you get your instructions okay? Why, sure, Joe. Hey, uh, I'm glad you're sure, but I ain't, see? I'm nervous about you. Well, I'll tell you what I'm supposed to do then. Hey, maybe you better. Well, I'm supposed to get the car at 8 o'clock tomorrow night and drive it to the Cross Creek Road and Highway 17. Yeah? Then I'm supposed to park it on a little side road off to the left. You and the boys will be on the other side of the road. There'll be a barricade across the road. And I'm just supposed to sit there until the armored truck comes along. Yeah? As soon as I see the lights of the armored truck, I'm supposed to start my engine and keep it running until you and the guys get through with the truck. Uh-huh. Satisfied I know what I'm supposed to do? Yeah, you're a good dog, Gladys. But uh, just a place safe. Keep away from me and the gang for tomorrow night, see? See you then, Dal. Okay, Joe. Night. Night. Did it work? Did it work, Mary? The accent must have been perfect. I should have been an actor. Well, all I can say is if you were one, you'd be a good actor. <laughs> Thanks, pal. Now I've got to make some plans to interfere with the plans of a gang of bad actors tomorrow night. Dirty Joe. What time's the armored truck supposed to come along? Right about now, Tony. Just keep your shirt on. It'll be long on schedule. The boys are spread out alongside the road. Glad I got here with the car, okay? It's parked over there on the tree. Yeah. Now, Gladys is a good doll. I'm glad she's in with us. You're taking an awful chance. Letting her in on a bigger one like this on her first job, ain't you, Joe? Yeah, but we had to have somebody to get the car all set to drive. This job is taking all of the boys, so we need us, eh? Oh, here's hoping she... Hey, look, Joe. Here comes the armored truck. Good. As soon as it rounds the curve in front of us, the driver will see the barricade. He'll have to slow down. Or maybe stop, huh? Yeah. Then we run up on it, toss the nitro under it, and boom, she's split open like a ripe watermelon. The truck's here, boss. The driver's seen the barricade. Slowing down. Okay, let's go. Throw the nitro under the truck, Tony. Toss it quick. There it goes. That a boy. That'll do it. Get it! She split wide open. Come on! All right. All right. Have the door out of the back, you guys. Beat it to the car. Come on! Yeah. Hurry it up! On, okay, we got the door, Joe. We got it. All right, come on. Let's go over this on, way. Man. That blast must have knocked off the guards. They ain't firing at us. Right. Hurry it up, will you? Over here, our cars. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, doll. Yeah. Get set to step on it. Okay, I'm all set. Everything go all right, Joe? Perfect. Perfect. You got nerve, kid. You ain't jittery or nothing. Yeah, it was a cinch, Gladys. Me and the gang got all the dough. All right, pile into you guys. Let's go. Okay, step on it, Gladys. Okay. Get back to town fast. Now I can't wait to count this stuff. Sure, Joe. We did it, huh? Oh, it was a cinch. Sure was. Not to it. I did all right on my first job, Joe. You were great, doll. Great. Hey, Joe. Look at the road ahead of us. It's barricaded. The place is full of cops. Cops. A hundred of them, Joe. What do we do? Drive right through the barricade? No, turn back. We'll beat it the other way. Well, we can't force our barricade in that busted up armored truck. Blocking the road behind us. Huh? Yeah, you're right. Oh, Joe, what are we gonna do? Yeah, there ain't nothing we can do, doll. Slow down and stop. We're giving ourselves up. I want to live a little while longer, even if it is in jail. All right, quiet, everybody. Quiet! This is a police lineup, not a vaudeville show. But I want quiet. We're ready with the prisoners, Inspector Faraday. All right. Start with the first one. Charles Day, alias Joe Lane, alias Bugsy Peterson, alias Lane Peterson. Nine arrests, no convictions, wanted for robbery, murder. A guard in that armored truck was killed. All right, O'Day. What have you got to say for yourself? I ain't talking, Faraday. You will, later. Okay, step down, O'Day. Let's have the next one. That is Harlan. No aliases, no arrests, no convictions. Wanted for robbery and murder. All right, Miss Harlan. What have you got to say for yourself? I, I, I don't have anything to say. You know you're going to face a murder charge for what you've done, don't you? I know it. But you can't prove it. What do you mean I can't prove it? You're guilty and you know it. Now, why don't you play it smart and admit it? Why should I? Because I'll prove it anyhow. I'll go easy on you if you talk. All right, I admit it. What do you admit? I admit everything. I drove the car for the game. But I didn't know anyone was going to be killed, honestly. I that didn't. That doesn't make any difference. A guard in that armored truck was killed. 
And if you drove the car for this gang, you're just as guilty as if you killed that guard with your own hand. No, I didn't. I didn't. Okay, step down. <laughs> come here. Come here, Miss Harnon. I want you in my office. Rollins, bring her over here, will you? Sure, Inspector. Here she is. Thanks, Rollins. I'll take her in my office. Uh, you take over here. Sure, Inspector. All right. <laughs> what are you going to do with me? Plenty. All right, go on. Go on. Get in there. What place is this? What happens to me now? Maybe a lot is going to happen to you, Miss Harlan. That depends mostly on you. What do you mean? You'll find out. Sit down. I said sit down. All right. That's better. Well, you're in sort of a jam, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I guess I am. What do you mean? You guess you are. I mean, I know I am. But I didn't know it was going to be like this at all. I thought it'd be smart to join Joe's gang. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be clever. But I know it wasn't now. Oh, you do, huh? Yes, and I should have known it before. I should have learned a lesson from what happened to my father. That's right. Look at him. He's in jail. And why? Because he was smart and thought he could get away with it. Well, he didn't get away with it. And I didn't either. I know it now. But a little too late, huh? Yeah, a little too late, Inspector. I guess I've got worse coming to me than came to my father. Oh, if I could only go back 24 hours and know what I know now, I wouldn't be in this mess. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, Miss Harlan, thanks to one man, you aren't in a mess. I'm not in a mess? What you in that buzzer for? I'll answer that last question, Gladys. It rang for me. Blackie. <laughs> yes, boss and Blackie. You seem almost glad to see me. Oh, I am, Blackie. I'm afraid it's too late. Oh, I don't think so, Gladys. You heard the inspector say you aren't in a mess. But I am. I was mixed up in that robbery, and a guard was killed. You weren't mixed up in anything, Gladys. And a guard wasn't killed. In fact, there were no guards in that armored truck. The driver set the wheel and jumped 50 yards before the barricade. They, they, they weren't? No, Miss Harlan. You and your pals didn't steal anything either. That armored truck was empty. Empty? Yes. What your pals stole was bags of slugs and a box filled with dirt. But, but, but how did... It's they... all very simple, Gladys. After you told me all about your part in the holdup, uh, I... I told you about my part in... Yes, when I called and asked you to run through the instructions. You thought I was Joe when I said... Hey, Dal, I want you to run through the instructions, see... It was you? Yes. And after that, I went to the armored truck company, told them what I was, well, what was going to happen. And Faraday and I framed this whole thing together. Well, then, then, then Joe and the gang haven't been arrested either. Oh, yes, Miss Farland. They're under arrest. I've been looking for him and that gang for a long time for other things. They're going to jail. Where am I going? Out of here, Gladys. Straight out of here, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Blackie, why did you want to help Gladys Harlan? Well, Mary, remember when I told you that Faraday caught my call on her father in my apartment with a gun on me? Mm-hmm. Well, he wasn't pointing that gun at me to kill me, but so that when Faraday broke in, I wouldn't be accused of harboring an escaped convict. He wasn't going to kill you? Well, then what was he doing in your apartment? Well, he heard through the prison grapevine that his daughter was getting mixed up with a gang. Oh, and he wanted to keep her from joining him. Yes, he even had her come up to prison to see him, but she wouldn't listen to him. Gee, you'd think she would have, though, wouldn't you? The father was in jail because he was caught by the police. Yes, but she told him she was too smart to be caught. That's when he decided to come to see me. Oh, and I know why he didn't go to the police. Because all they do is send her to prison. Yes, and he didn't want that. So he broke jail and came to see me, hoping that I could do something with her. Well, that covers everything, I guess. And so does that lovely evening wrap you're wearing. Why, thank you, sir. You'll sure be an attraction tonight. Think so? Look what I'm wearing underneath. Good night. A checkered skirt and a striped sweater. Where do you think you're on your way to? To the Traveler's Barn, of course. Mary, we're going to the Carlton Plaza. Oh. And I said you'd be an attraction. Wow. At the Carlton Plaza in this outfit, Blackie? I won't be an attraction. I'll be a sensation.
Dr. Austin, I just won't believe it. I know my grandfather was murdered. But that's impossible, Linda. Your grandfather was in a hospital bed, attended by several doctors, I among them, Mm. when he died. Yes, I know that. But just the same, I know that Joe Reed killed him. Linda, you'll have to face the facts. I know as well as you do that Joe Reed hated your grandfather. But your grandfather died a natural death. He suffered from heart trouble for 18 years. It was his heart that killed him. No, Doctor. Joe Reed killed him. I know it. I feel it. Why, Linda? Why would Reed kill your grandfather? You know very well why, Dr. Austin. Grandfather left him $50,000 in his will. Well, if that's your only logic, you and I had a reason to kill your grandfather, too. He hmm? left me 25000 And uh, you get more than 100000 That doesn't make any difference. Grandfather was going to cut Joe Reed out of his will. I know it, and I think Reed knew it, too. And he killed Grandfather before he could do it. You keep him from changing his will, eh? Isn't that what you'd do, Doctor? I wouldn't commit murder for $50,000 or for any amount, and neither would Joe. No, Linda, I know you dislike Reed, but I'm afraid you can't make trouble for him. Your grandfather died a natural death. Well, I know he didn't, Dr. Austin. I know that Joe murdered him, and I'm going to prove it. How, Linda? How? I'm going to Boston Blackie. That's how. Now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Hello? Hello, Tom. This is Bob. Oh, how are you, Bob? Hi. What's new? Oh, nothing. Just the same old stuff. Hey, uh, uh, doing anything this weekend? No, I don't think so. Oh, yes, Mrs. Van Grifton. Oh, no, not that. Yeah. (laughs) Wants me to come to her country home for the weekend, but... Oh, brother. I think I'll have a much better time at... Yeah? No. Hello? Who are you? Hello, Tom. Put down that knife. Hello? (laughs) Tom! Tom! And don't be late for supper. Where did you come from? Who are you? No. No, put down that knife. the third one, Inspector Faraday, lying right here on the dock where Patrolman Murphy found him. The third one in five hours, and all with a 10-cent store kitchen knife stuck in him. Rollins, we've got a madman on the loose. Yeah, kill him for the fun of it. This is got me, no kidding. First Tom Marshall, one of the richest men in town, then that housewife out in Green Meadows, and now this, this bum at the waterfront. And bum is about the only identification we have on this one, Inspector. Don't know who he is, huh? No identification. Now, take him to the morgue. Maybe we'll get identification from fingerprints or dental work, if any. But we've got to work fast and grab this killer, or we'll have another body lying around somewhere. Yeah, but how are we going to figure where this killer is going to strike next? He just picks out anybody, anywhere, and sticks a knife in it. I know, but there must be some way to... Hey, who's this? You might know who it is. Blanky, what are you doing here? Looking for you. It looks as if my mission is accomplished. Hey, what do you got here? What does it look like? Hmm. Stabbed, huh? No, strangled. The knife in his chest is just for effect. <laughs> Beat it, will you? I got enough trouble. Since when is one body trouble for the great Inspector Faraday? Uh, one body isn't. But this happens to be the third one in the last five hours. What? Yeah, the third. And all killed in the same way. By the same type of instrument. <laughs> A ten-cent store kitchen knife. All here at the waterfront, of course? No, one of the victims was Tom Marshall. The millionaire? Yeah. Killed in his home. The second was a woman, Mrs. Harriet Jones. She was killed the same way, on a street out in Green Meadows. And now this, huh? Yeah. This one we can't even identify. You've got a problem worse than mine. I'll say I have. And don't make it any better. Stay out of it. Stay out of it, old Faraday. How can I? Three absolutely unrelated people killed the same way in three different parts of town. Tell you what let's do. And this is going to be good. I'll take this case and you take mine. 
I'm trying to prove murder in the case of an old man who died of heart trouble in the hospital. Uh, look, will you quit bothering me with child's play? Child's play is awfully consistent with your mentality. Look, you get out of my sight and stay out. I've got a madman on the loose. I don't want you bothering me till I got him on the books. <laughs> Where are we going, Blackie? The city hospital, Mary, to see Dr. Austin. What can he have to do with the three madmen murders? Nothing, Mary. Faraday won't let me work on that case with him. He won't give me enough information so I can go to work on it myself. So? So I'm going to see what I can do for Linda Graham. Oh, Blackie, it's just nonsense to believe what she told you about her grandfather being killed. Oh, Mr. Graham died of heart trouble. I know, but she thinks a man named Joe Reed killed him. Now, how? He died in a hospital bed surrounded by doctors. I know that, too. But according to Miss Graham's story, Joe Reed was an old man Graham's secretary. Oh, I see. And all secretaries kill their bosses. Now, what sense is that? <laughs> None. Reed was afraid he was going to be cut out of old man Graham's will, so he wanted to kill him before he had a chance to change that will. You say that as if you believe it. No, Mary, I don't believe it. Not yet, anyhow. But Miss Graham came to me in good faith, and I promised her that I'd do what I can for her. So? So you're going to do what you can for her. Which is? Nothing? Well, not exactly nothing. I'm going to talk to old man Graham's doctor and to everyone else involved, but I'm afraid what I'll end up with is nothing. Well, here's the hospital. Well, here goes nothing. Dr. Austin? Yes, I'm Dr. Austin. I'm Boston Blackie. Doctor. How do you do? You won't mind if I ask you a few questions, will you? No, not at all, Blackie. In fact, I've been expecting you. You have? Yes. Linda said she was going to see you. Well, she did see me. She thinks her grandfather was murdered. Yes, yes, I know. And by Joe Reed. Uh-huh, because Joe Reed was afraid he was going to be cut out of Graham's will. Any possibility Reed murdered Graham? None whatsoever, Blackie. I treated Graham for 18 years. He died in this hospital in the presence of two other doctors, both of whom have attested that heart failure killed him. Thank you, Doctor. It looks as if Graham's death was quite all right, and Miss Linda Graham is quite all wrong. <laughs> for a pretty girl, you're awfully stupid, Miss Graham. Or is there a lot of truth in the expression, beautiful but dumb? I don't know how you have the nerve to talk to me, Mr. Reed. I didn't want to talk to you, Miss Graham. You wanted to talk to me. This is uh, my apartment, you know. And why do you even have an apartment? Because my grandfather was too kind to fire you, even after you had robbed him. I robbed your grandfather? Then why wasn't I sent to jail? Mr. Reed, you know very well why you weren't. Grandfather wouldn't prosecute. No, of course not, because he had no proof. Just as you have no proof that your grandfather died of anything but a bad heart. You killed him, didn't you? My dear Miss Graham, your grandfather's death is a matter of medical record. He was an old man who had suffered for many years from an ailing heart. His heart just stopped beating. But you wanted him to die, didn't you? I'm $50,000 richer. And I like his money much better than I like him. But you knew he was going to cut you out of his will, didn't you? No. Did you? Yes, I did. He told me so two weeks ago, and he told you. That's why you killed him. My dear Miss Graham, must even the simplest of facts be explained to you? A heart attack killed your grandfather. No, Mr. Reed, you killed him. I don't know how, but I'm going to find out, and I'm going to prove it. Miss Graham, I'd advise you to let matters stand as they are. Stay away from me. I'd like to be amused by your accusations, Miss Graham. But your insistence is beginning to bore me. But I hate to be bored. Now get out. I'll help you. Here. Oh, let go. Come, come, oh, Miss Graham. It's not go, that bad. Let go, I think I will oh, teach no. you to I learn. Teach you, Reed. Oh. Who are you? Blackie. Blackie, I'm so glad you're here. That makes two of us. But I'm afraid Mr. Reed isn't going to make that unanimous. Blackie. Boston Blackie, I suppose. Well, both of you get out of here. What's the matter, Reed? Want to be alone? Yes. Will you settle for being half alone? What do you mean? Miss Graham, will you step out for a while, please? My car is parked down in front. You want me to leave? Well, uh, maybe, uh, you'd better stay, Miss Graham. Changed your mind awfully fast, didn't you, Reed? Too bad you didn't change mine. Go ahead, Miss Graham. Wait for me in my car. All right, Black, if you say so. I'll wait there. Reed was teaching you something a minute ago, Miss Graham. Now he's going to take a lesson from the professor. 
I won't be long. He looks like a good student. I'll wait for you, Blackie. Now, Reed, there's only one thing I have to say to you, and that's... Hey! What did you hit me for, Blackie? I, I haven't done anything to you. That little tap was for not knowing how to talk to a lady. This one is for twisting her arm a few minutes ago. Hey, don't! Don't hit me again! Get up, you rat. I don't trust you. You're liable to crawl in your hole in the wall. Get up! You've got no right to come here and hit me. The police would oh, like to you know that you... Oh, you go to the you... police, will you? Maybe I ought to let you have one in advance in case you do. No, no, don't. Now, please don't. I won't go to them. I, I, I won't go near them. Reed, I didn't know why I didn't like you when I walked in here. I still don't know. Sure. But I kind of like not liking you. It uh, sort of makes me a nicer guy. Now, why don't you leave me alone, Blackie? I, I never interfered with you. You know, Miss Graham had an idea. You were responsible for her grandfather's death. He died of... I know, I know. He died of heart. Yeah. Her idea is that perhaps you didn't actually kill him, but you were responsible for something phony somewhere along the line. Yes. And after seeing you, I don't got it. Now, let me alone, Blackie. No, please, let me alone. Sure. Sure, I'll let you alone. Oh, hey. Only you've given me some cause for thought. You're so exact, so precise. Your clothes, uh, well, they're just so. I wonder how your etiquette is. I wonder if you know the proper way to, let's say, uh, Hold a knife. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Linda Graham comes to Blackie to accuse Joe Reed of murdering her aged grandfather. But authoritative medical reports show the grandfather died in a hospital bed of a heart ailment he had been suffering from for 18 years. Meanwhile, Inspector Faraday is faced with a baffling trio of murders. Three people in three different parts of town and in three different walks of life are murdered in the same way and all within the space of five hours. As we return to our story, Blackie, unable to solve his case, walks into police headquarters to see how Inspector Faraday is doing with his. Hello, Rollins. How are you this afternoon? Fine, Blackie. Glad to hear it. Hey, don't bother to announce me. I'll go right into Faraday's office. Oh, no, you don't, Blackie. The inspector doesn't want to see you. Even if he telephoned for me, Rollins? Oh, he called for you? Well, that's different. Go right in. Thanks, Rollins. Hey, wait a minute. Blackie, come back here. Did the inspector call for you? I didn't yeah, say he did, Rollins. My best chance was if I he said had even if he did. Yeah, that's right, Doctor. Thanks for letting me in. Okay. You got the identification, huh? Good. Thanks, Dr. Parker. Goodbye. Oh, so it's you. Well, the same goes for you, too, Blanky. Goodbye. Now, Faraday, you know you don't mean that. You're glad to see me, aren't you? Yes, Blanky, I am. Looking at you makes me realize how lucky I am. To be me. Well, lucky you. How lucky have you been with those three murders? Well, I haven't been lucky at all. I've been smart. I got identification on the body we found at the waterfront. Yeah? Huh? yeah. Did the dead man wake up and tell all? No. He was identified through his dental work. Oh, that's all. What dentist? None of your business. Oh, all right. I'll solve the case by tracing back the knives using the stabbing. I've already done that. They can't be traced. They're ordinary kitchen knives bought at the ten cent stores. And every dime store in town carries them. Hmm. You just don't want me to help you, do you? I'll tell you a little secret, Blackie. What? No! Faraday, who was the dentist who identified the third victim? None of your business. Oh, come on, Faraday, please. No! Please, Faraday. No, I said! All right. But I'll tell you something else you said, Inspector. What? You were on the phone when I came in, and you said, thanks lots, Dr. Parker. So what? So Parker is a doctor. A doctor can be a dentist, and... I'm going to see him to get my teeth into this case. Yes, Blackie, I identified the dental work for Inspector Faraday. The dead man was Ernest Brown, a carpenter here in the building. I see. But, uh... Well, do you know any reason why anyone would want to kill him, Dr. Parker? No, no, not at all. But I will tell you something. I was about to call the police when you came in. Uh, Mrs. Harriet Jones, the madman's second victim, was also a patient of mine. What? Uh, yes, Miss Wesley. Oh, I know that she lived out in Green Meadows, but I used to practice out there, and, well, she got in the habit of coming to me. Well, 
Now, uh, don't tell us Tom Marshall was a patient of yours, too. If he was, I'm going to faint. <laughs> well, uh, Tom Marshall wasn't a regular patient of mine. Uh, he was passing by one day, and he had a toothache, and saw my sign, and stopped in for an emergency treatment. Ooh. One day, what one day? That might have some significance. Yes, I think it does, Blackie. Uh, that's what I was going to call the police about. It was a week ago last Friday. Well, why call the police about that? Because, Miss Wesley, a week ago last Friday, Ernest Brown and Harriet Jones were in my office, too. And all three of them were here at the same time. Well, I'd say that's interesting, but it's not. It's more than interesting. You uh, think it has direct bearing on their being murdered by this madman? I don't know. It's the first hint of a connection of the three of them. Dr. Parker, while they were here, was anyone else with them? No. Uh, no. No, no, the three of them were alone in the waiting room. Uh, My nurse and I were busy in the other room with another patient. Then that's it. While they were sitting here, they saw something or heard something. The killer didn't want them to see you here. Come on, Mary. Where to? I'll tell you later. Dr. Parker. Yes? uh, Call Inspector Faraday and give him the information you just gave me, but tell him not to do anything about it until he hears from me. All right. Come on, Mary. Let's grab an elevator and get out of here. All right. Back here, are we really on the way? What are you looking at? At that door at the other end of the hall. Here, I'll wait for the elevator. For goodness sake, by the name on the door, it's Lester Graham's old office. Yes. It's very interesting. Maybe our mad killer is Joe Reed, and the three patients in Parker's office heard him say he was going to kill... Oh, no. Why not? Oh, just one little fact, Mary. Graham wasn't murdered. Hmm. Still, Graham's office being so near the dentist's waiting room would put Reed in possible contact with the three murder victims. Because he was Graham's secretary? Yeah, I suppose so. But why would all three of them be killed? What do they have in common? They weren't witnesses to a murder or anything like that. No, but what were they witnesses to? You'll find the answer to that and you'll find out why they were killed. That's a great statement, Mary. Oh, I'm a great girl. My gosh, have the elevators in this building stopped running? Huh? Oh, what are you doing, daydreaming? No, day thinking. What can three different people from three different parts of the city have in common? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But let's stay with that witness angle. What could they have seen? Mary, I've got it. If there was another will cutting Reed out of Graham's first will, I've got it. Got what? Mary, it takes three witnesses to make a will absolutely uncontestable. The three people in Parker's waiting room could have been witnesses to Graham's second will. If there there was such a thing, he could have been looking for witnesses and walked in there. That's right, Blackie. And Reed knew about the will, stole it, destroyed it, and then killed the three witnesses. That is, of course, providing a second will existed. Well, how can you find out? As you say, it's probably been destroyed. I think I know how, Mary. Come on. We've got to get to a telephone. Who are you calling, Blackie? Joe Reed, Mary. And here's hoping he doesn't call my bluff. Here's hoping, too. Here's bluffing. Hello? Uh, Joe Reed? Yes? This is Dr. Parker. Who? Uh, Dr. Lester Parker, the dentist. I don't think I know you, do I? Uh, No, we've never met, but I think we should meet him soon. Why? I know something I think you should know. What's that? I know why those three people were knifed to death yesterday afternoon. Oh, really? Well, what about it? I think maybe we'd better have a little talk. About what? About why those three people were killed. Look, I, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. But I do. It's old man Graham's will... The three murdered people were witnesses to it. But I was too, in a way. I just didn't have time to sign my name to it. So? So I saw what was in the will, accidentally, of course. It seems you were cut off without a cent. Now, isn't that interesting? It is to me. It didn't mean anything to me then, but it does now. See me in my office at ten o'clock tonight, and I'll tell you how much... to this office of yours, Dr. Parker? Yes, Blackie. Just the door to the reception room here. Yeah. No, that's good. He won't sneak up behind us, huh? No, if he shows up at all, which I'm beginning to doubt. It's ten after ten already, and not a sign of him. Mm. 
Maybe your trick isn't going to work. Maybe Reed isn't a murderer. But it won't be your fault if I can't prove anything. You're a brave guy to go through with this, Doctor. If Reed's the man we're after, he's a dangerous killer. Blackie, we simply... The elevator door just opened. Good, now. Shh. Stay back from the door. Don't worry, I'm back. He's coming down the hall. Now I hear him. Take him to your office when he gets in. But leave the door open so I can hear. I'll get back at this desk now. Just outside the door now. Thanks. Hello, Blackie. You here? Oh, Faraday. Blackie, what are you doing hiding in the dark? Not trying to hide from you, Inspector. Turn on the lights, Dr. Parker. All right. I'm afraid our trick didn't work. What trick? And what was Miss Wesley's idea of telling me you were in danger? Skip it. Inspector, you know Dr. Parker. Yes, yes. Sure. Blackie, what are you up to? I thought I was up to grabbing your killer for you. But it seems my suspect didn't come up to be grabbed. Come on, Doctor. I'll drive you home. Okay, I'll get You come along too, Faraday. I'll tell you all about it on the way. Well, thanks for the lift home, Blackie. It's all right, Doctor. Glad to do it. Thanks for helping me try to catch Reed. Well, looks as if he was either not gullible or too smart for us, though. It doesn't take much to be too smart for Blackie. No, Faraday, is that nice? No, just true, that's all. (laughs) Good night, Inspector. Good night. Night, Blackie. Night, Parker. Good evening, Uh Dr. Parker. Who are you? You ought to know, Dr. Parker. You said you wanted to see me tonight in your office at 10 o'clock. You're Joe Reed. Marvelous deduction. Sorry I couldn't keep my appointment with you at your office. But it seems so unwise. I don't like traps. Traps? Do I look like a fool, Dr. Parker? Oh. Oh, I see. You were afraid the police might be waiting in my office with me, eh? Yeah. Do I look like a fool, Mr. Reed? Look, I can make a great deal of money keeping the police away from you. You can? Yes, as much as you can afford to pay. What makes you think so? What I know about you, old man Graham's second will, and the three people killed by what the police think is a madman. You think I killed them? I know you did. I think we can come to an understanding. If. What are you talking about? About keeping my mouth shut. If you keep your wallet open. How do I know you haven't already gone to the police? I wouldn't be talking money if I had. Yeah. Oh, well, believe me, you're quite safe so far. No one else knows about Graham's second will, the one you probably destroyed. No one but me. Nobody knows, huh? Only the two of us. Hmm. I'd be a lot safer if there were only one of us, wouldn't I? Now, look here. You You look look here. You'll see a gun in my hand. A nice, well-loaded gun. Too bad you kept this to yourself, Doctor, because that gives me a reason for killing you. You don't care how many people you kill, do you? No, one more or less won't make any difference. It's worth a lot to me. Yes, $50,000. Yeah, and I had a lot of time and effort. I had to wait till old man Graham died a natural death before I started. But when you're out of the way, I'll be safe. The second will's destroyed, the witnesses are dead, and soon you will be, too. You wouldn't be so smug if you just looked behind your Reed. <laughs> Think I'd fall for that when you're crazy. Glad you didn't read. <laughs> well, I hope he's got a hard head. Nice work, Lucky. Nice work yourself, Parker. You couldn't have talked to Reed any better if we'd rehearsed for ten hours. Well, Parker. Yes? Did Reed outsmart me as much as you thought? <laughs> no, I guess he didn't, Lucky. When he didn't show up at your office, I guessed he'd be smart enough to come here to your home. So we ducked back in here through a window. Yep. (laughs) I guess you could say uh, we came through, huh? It's funny how I knew Joe was guilty, Faraday. He irritated me. Every time I saw Reed, I saw Red.
Yeah? Boston, calling Inspector Faraday. I'm Inspector Faraday. One moment, please. Here's your party. Go ahead, Boston. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Blackie? What are you doing out of town? You don't know? I can guess. You talked me into holding John Barnes in the Bradley killing for me to make an arrest. Then you beat it out of town because you knew I didn't have enough evidence to hold him. Why, you're ungrateful, Inspector. I found out Barnes had a motive to kill Bradley, didn't I? Yeah. I proved Barnes had an opportunity to kill Bradley, didn't I? Yeah. I also found a witness who did a pretty good job of placing Barnes at the scene of Bradley's death, too, didn't I? Yes, but you didn't clinch the case against him. Didn't I? No. What I need is proof that Bradley was killed with Barnes' gun. I don't have Barnes' gun. Well, you do now, Faraday, because everything that's mine is yours, pal. You, you've got the murder gun? How'd you get it, Blanky? Where? Up here in Boston. But do you really want to know how I had to be sort of a bad boy to get it? Uh, forget I asked. Forgotten. In a few hours, Faraday, you'll have the murder gun in your own little hand. And then you can give it to Barnes right in his neck. Uh, Blanky, uh, be careful, will you? Why? Barnes's pals aren't the friendly type. They not only want to get that gun, they're going to want to get you. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> New York, calling Mr. Gus Johnson. I'll take it. Thank you. Go ahead, New York. Here's your party. Gus. Yeah. This is Johnny. Johnny Barnes. Oh, yeah, Johnny. Uh, just checking. You went to Boston to get rid of that gun of mine. Did you do it? Yeah, I got rid of it. The hard way. It was stolen about an hour ago. I was going to call you. Stolen? Who stole it? Guess who? Boston Blackie. Yeah. I figured on trouble from him when I heard he followed me here to Boston. By the time I got back to the hotel, he'd already swiped the gun. Where's Blackie now? At his hotel. I got Joe trailing him. That was his last report. Well, get up there and get back that gun. I can't, Johnny. It's too late. Look, you want me to go to the chair? Of course not. Well, I will if you don't find that gun. The cops know I hit it, Bradley. They know plenty more, too, but they need that gun to prove I knocked him off. I know. Then get it back from Blackie. It's registered in my name, and ballistics will prove it was the gun that killed Bradley. If the cops get that gun, I'm finished. What am I to do, Johnny? Blackie sent the gun to Faraday. Air mail. What? Joe was watching him. He couldn't do anything about it. Too many people around. Oh. It's, uh, it's in the mail to Faraday now, huh? Yeah. Gus. Gus, I got an idea. And you're just the guy who can make it work. <laughs> Say, Miss Wesley, what time did that wire say Blackie's plane was getting in? Three o'clock, Shorty. Gee, three o'clock, huh? Gosh, we're a little late getting there, ain't we? Yes, a little. I wish we'd started earlier. I'd like to have seen his plane come in. Yeah, me too. But not because I think planes is pretty. Oh? Well, then why, Shorty? Well, didn't Blackie's telegram say he got the gun Johnny Barnes used to kill that Bradley guy? Oh, no, no. He told me that on the phone. Well, Blackie's going to need protection from the minute he gets off that plane. I know a couple of the Barnes mob, and they ain't forgiven characters. But they're going to be awful sore at Blackie when Barnes gets sent to the chair. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. When Inspector Faraday gets Barnes' gun, Barnes is as good as convicted, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, here's the airport. Where do we park? Well, let's see, uh... Why don't you drive right up to the administration building? We're late, and Blackie's probably waiting for us inside. Okay. Hey, how about here? That's fine. Want to come in with me? Yeah, sure. I'll get out on your side. All right. Uh, I think we can go in that door there. Okay. Hey, wait. Wait, I'll open the door for you. Thank you. At gate six, all aboard. 
Oh, a big joint this is. Yes, it is, isn't it? I don't see Blackie anywhere, though, do you? No, no, I don't. Well, maybe his plane's late. Let's ask at the information desk. Okay. Flight 31 for Washington, Cincinnati, and Chicago, leaving at gate 6. All aboard. Well, it's the information desk, Miss Wesley. Oh, yes. Uh, pardon me, but could I have some information? Uh, yes, ma'am. Has the plane from Boston arrived yet? Flight 68. Oh, oh, you, you, yes, of course. Flight 68. No, ma'am. Flight 68 is late, but we expect it soon. Gate 3. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Wesley, shall we go out to gate three and watch it come in? No, Shorty. You can see if we'll wait here and watch through that big window there. Oh, yeah. Hey, look at that big four motor job taking off out there. Yes, I see it. But I'm more interested in seeing Blackie's plane come in. Hey, Miss Wesley, you ain't worried because Blackie's plane is late, are you? I don't know, Shorty. I, I... It's just that I have a funny feeling. Oh, Miss Wesley, planes have been late before... Well, sometimes maybe an hour late. They have a flat tire or they get stuck on a sticky cloud Look, Shorty, or something. Inspector Faraday's just come in. I don't know, but he sees us. Gosh, you don't think maybe something's gone wrong, huh? Well, Hello, I don't Ms. know. I... Hello, Shorty. Hello, oh, Inspector. Hi, what, Inspector. Are you, uh, what are you here for? What do you think I'm here for? To meet a train? Well, you here to meet Blackie too, Inspector Faraday? Yeah. How'd you know? Oh, I'm just smart, I guess. You smart, bad guess. Isn't Blackie's plane in yet? No, Inspector. It's late. I might have known. Blackie's probably telling the pilot how to fly. What plane's Blackie on? Flight 68. Flight 68, huh? It'll be just like Blackie to keep that plane up, so I'll have to wait for hours. <laughs> well, I'm waiting. Come in, Flight 68. Tom, any word from Flight 68? Not a peep for the last five hours, Harry. Not a peep, huh? Doesn't seem possible. Four hours overdue on a flight of an hour and ten minutes. Have you kept checking? Every five minutes. I'll try again, Tom. Okay. New York calling Cross Nation Airways, flight 68. New York calling Cross Nation Airways, flight 68. Flight 68, come in. Flight 68, come in. Come in. Now hold it, Tom. Anything? Nothing. Well, when did you last hear? Ten minutes out of Boston. Pilot radio is okay. Said he was on the beam. And not a word since? Not a word. Well, we got a lost plane then, Tom. He's out of gas and down somewhere by now. But uh, keep trying to make contact. We may... Any word from Flight 68 yet? Say, nobody's allowed in the control tower, and that means you, too. I'm Inspector Faraday, police. Oh, sorry, Inspector. Skip it. Any word from Flight 68? No, she's four hours overdue, and that means she's down somewhere out of gas. Or maybe worse. Yeah, I'd think so, too. Except we haven't had a report of any crash. You mean the plane's just disappeared? So far it has. Look, let me see that passenger list. There's something crazy about this. Yeah, the passenger list is the craziest thing about the whole flight, Inspector. What do you mean? Well, flight 68 is a 21-passenger ship. 20 reservations were canceled at the last minute. Huh? That's right. So the plane left Boston with only one passenger. One passenger? Oh. A man by the name of Boston Blackie. <laughs> Gosh, Miss Wesley, why don't they put cushions on the seats in this place? Buddy, here comes Inspector Faraday. Maybe he has word about Blackie's plane. Gee, he looks awful sick, Miss Wesley. He does, doesn't he? What is it, Inspector? I'm afraid I got bad news for you, Miss Wesley. Oh. Looks as if Flight 68 has had an accident. Oh, no, Gee. no, I... I... Blackie was on it, Miss Wesley. Oh. The only passenger. Here, here Miss Wesley. Maybe, maybe you better sit down, huh? No, no, it's all right. Wesley. Did I hear my name? Uh, yeah, phone call, Miss Wesley. Wesley. You want me to take uh, No, 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 I'll get it myself. Uh, the information desk is right over here. I'll, I'll get it. Oh, we'll go with you, Miss Wesley. Yeah, sure. Oh, all right, maybe you better. Here, here we are. Uh, this is Miss Wesley. Uh, she'll take that call. Oh, yes, right here, ma'am. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Mary? Blackie! Blackie? Bla oh, Blackie, where are you? In my apartment. You obviously didn't get my second wire. Oh, no, no, darling, I didn't. My plane reservation was canceled, no flight, so I wired you and took the train. You took the train, but but Inspector Faraday was told you were on that plane. Faraday, is he there? Yes, yes, he's right here. Let me talk to him. All right. Here, Inspector, he wants to talk to you. Thanks. Oh, Shorty, he's all right. Blanky, what's the idea? I, I thought you were dead. Well, that's about as accurately as you usually think, Faraday. Well, what else could I think? That plane you were going to take has disappeared. You're listed as a passenger, the only passenger. Well, that's crazy, Faraday. The airline told me the plane wasn't even going to fly. Well, it did fly. 
and carrying one passenger who called himself Boston Blackie, it vanished into thin air. You meet me in my office, Blackie. If I got a hunch you can explain this. And I think you'd better. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. John Barnes kills a man named Bradley and gives the gun to a friend, Gus Johnson, to get rid of in Boston. Blackie trails Johnson to Boston, steals the gun from him, and mails it to Inspector Faraday, thereby sealing Barnes' fate as a killer and wires Mary Wesley that he is en route by plane. But the plane, supposedly carrying Blackie, disappears into thin air. Actually, Blackie has come back to the city by train. And as we return to our story, he is in Faraday's office, trying to solve the mystery of the missing plane. A plane just doesn't disappear, Faraday. Apparently you've been reading too many spook stories. Mm. And I haven't. So getting me down here was just a waste of time. All right, Blackie. If that plane hasn't disappeared... You tell me where it is. It's down somewhere. Forced landing with a radio data. Maybe it crashed. No good. They told me at the airport, if the plane was down or crashed, they'd have a report almost immediately. They don't have a report yet, and the plane is now eight hours overdue. Uh, let me see now. I got a call from the airline in Boston about an hour before plane time. The man said my flight was canceled. They'd send for my ticket right away and give me another one later. Uh huh. So a bellboy came up for my ticket, and I gave it to him. Then, instead of waiting for the next plane, I took the train. Well, what does that explain? It explains why I wasn't on the plane. I have a hunch that I was called not by the airline, but by Johnny Barnes' pal, Gus Johnson. And he took that plane in my place. Why? I think this is why. He saw me send the gun to you, airmail. Then he found out a package mailed at that time would leave Boston on Flight 68. Uh-huh. He had to get that gun out of the mail. But that was impossible, so he did the next best thing. He stole the plane. He stole the plane? Sure. Because when he stole the plane, he also stole the gun. I'm sure that's what happened. Well, maybe so. But does that explain why the 20 other passengers on Flight 68 canceled their reservations at the last minute? Sure it does. It was decided for them the same way it was decided for me. Friday, the whole thing is beginning to make sense now. Yeah, but it's only theory. You get on the phone to Boston, and I think you'll find out it's all fact. Well, I intend to. But I'm not as interested in that missing plane as I am in that missing gun. How can I convict Barnes without it? You can't, Faraday. You know it, I know it, and Barnes knows it. Well, that makes three of us all in agreement. Aren't we clever? I don't know. I'm going to see Barnes now and find out if he's as clever as he thinks he is. <laughs> How nice of you to call on me, Blackie. You've uh, come to console me in my trouble, of course. Oh, I don't think you need consolation from me, Barnes. Aren't your, uh, your close friends doing plenty of weeping and wailing? Not exactly. Look, Barnes, your pal Gus Johnson told you I sent the gun to Faraday by airmail, didn't he? Did he? I think he did. And I think you found out the gun was being sent on Flight 68 out of Boston. So you saw to it that Flight 68 never reached New York. Oh, say, I, I just heard on the radio about that unfortunate plane. Fantastic, isn't it? It hasn't crashed, it hasn't made a forced standing, and it hasn't been heard of. Just vanished. Strange, isn't it? I don't think it's strange at all. I think you stole that plane. You think... Uh... <laughs> well, that's more fantastic than the fact the plane is missing. <laughs> now, how could I steal an airplane? <laughs> Why would I steal an airplane? To get rid of that pistol. It carried evidence that would send you to the electric chair. It was one way for you to steal back your gun. Oh, so you've lost the gun, huh, Blackie? Well, maybe you're the one that needs consoling. Please allow me to be the first to offer... Save it, Barnes. When they start giving out consolation prizes, I think you'll get them all. <laughs> Hello? Blackie, this is Shorty. Yes, Shorty. Gee, am I glad you finally lighted Miss Wesley's apartment. I've been calling you all over town. What's the matter, Shorty? I got some news for you. What is it? Gus Johnson's in town. He 
Blondie's in the hospital with a broken leg. You sure? Yeah. His girlfriend, Blondie White, just told me all about it. A broken leg, huh? Yep. How'd he break it? I don't know, Blackie. Even Miss White didn't know that. Thanks, Shorty. I think I'll go see him. Uh, but tell me, do you know anything about Gus? Anything I ought to know to make him start talking? No, Blackie, I don't. He hasn't been with Barnes very long, though. Oh, a new member of the gang, huh? Uh-huh. Well, what did he do before he joined Barnes? Oh, a little bit of everything, I guess. Blondie White told me he did a lot of crazy things. What, for instance? Well, he was an auto racer, a circus daredevil, a stunt pilot, a seaman, steeplejack. And that's enough, Shorty. That's more than enough. <laughs> You don't mind coming to the hospital with me, do you, Mary? Are you kidding, Blackie? I'm a nurse, remember? I'm not a patient. Don't be bad. Oh, nurse. Yes? <laughs> I mean the nurse behind the oh, desk. Oh, you. Oh, nurse. Yes? We'd like to see Gus Johnson. Is it as loud? Uh, oh, yes. And uh, Mr. Johnson is resting quite comfortably. He hasn't had a visitor since three o'clock. It's four now. I, I suppose you can go right in. Thanks. Uh, which room is he in? Oh, that one right there, 7-Eleven. Thank you. Come on, Mary. I'm right with you. Here's Johnson's room. Yes, 7-Eleven. Sure is a lucky number. Too bad he didn't have it before he said this book. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the matter? Does he answer? No. Well, maybe he's asleep. He might be. But it'll be all right if we go in. Or the nurse wouldn't have said so. Come on. Oh, yes, he's sleeping all right. Seems just like a baby. That baby has a record of 11 arrests and three convictions. Oh. Well, let's wake him up. Hey, Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Johnson, we... What, are you going to wake up? No, Mary. Not now or ever. He's got a knife in his heart. Get the nurse quick. Oh, yes, yes, all right. Oh, nurse. Nurse. Will you come here? What's the matter? It's the patient, Mr. Johnson. What's the matter with it? Uh, nothing except that he has a knife in his heart. But, but how, how did that... Nurse, that... you said Mr. Johnson had a visitor about an hour ago. Who was that? Well, I, I don't know. I didn't pay much attention. But, uh, please, I've got to call a doctor and get the police. In just a minute. Uh, was the visitor a man? Uh, well, yes, but I, I can't remember what he looked like, but... But Mr. Johnson wasn't a sick man. He could have all the visitors he wanted. I, I just didn't pay any attention to anyone who came to see him. Well, did anyone else come to see him? Well, uh, uh, yes, a girl this morning. What'd she look like? Well, she was blonde. That's all I remember, just blonde. Oh, that must have been his girlfriend, Blondie White. How'd you know about her, Blackie? Shorty told me about her this morning. She told him she'd been here. Uh, thanks, nurse. You can call the police now. Come on, Mary. Sure thing. Okay, wait, wait, aren't you going to stay? The, the police are going... Will want to see me? Or just tell them the name was Blackie. They'll know where to find me. Where? At Blondie White's. She doesn't know it yet, but she's got something awfully important to tell me. I hope you don't mind my coming to see you so soon after Gus's death, Miss White. No, Blackie. Why should I mind? Well, maybe you'll have reason to when you find out why I'm here. I didn't kill Gus, if that's what you're leading up to. No, I don't think you did. But I think you know who did. I don't know a thing. Now, look. You saw Gus this morning. He probably told you a lot of things. Maybe even who was coming to see him later in the day. You look, Blackie. Gus is dead, and that's trouble enough for me for one day. I'm not going to shoot my mouth off and get a dose of the same thing Gus got. But you do know who came to see Gus this afternoon. I said I wasn't talking. You don't have to be afraid of me, Miss White. I'm not scared of you. You didn't kill Gus. You're afraid of the man who did. Look, when you know something that isn't healthy to talk about, you don't talk about it. I understand that. But do you know what you're doing by keeping quiet? You're protecting the man who killed Gus. No, I'm not. I'm just protecting myself. Well, I'll fix it so you won't need protection. Will you talk then? I don't know. Look, I'll make a bargain with you. If I promise to send Johnny Barnes to the chair for killing Bradley, will you tell me who killed Gus? Sure. Thanks, Miss White. What? Thanks a lot. Thanks for what? In the one word, sure, you told me who killed Gus. It was Barnes. You don't know that. Oh, yes, I do, Miss White. 
You promised to tell me who killed Gus if I sent Barnes to the chair for killing Bradley. That means he couldn't scare you anymore. Stick by me, and I'll get him for sticking a knife into your boyfriend, too. Look, Barnes, you're in a police station, not a laugh movie. So take that smirk off your face. <laughs> I'm sorry, Inspector Fire, but I can't help it. You, Blackie, are both wasting your time keeping me here. Let us worry about that, Barnes. Well, sure, Blackie. I'm not worried about anything. I've just been too smart for you. Yeah, you've been smart, Barnes. But not smart enough. I know exactly what happened to that missing plane now and why it had only one passenger on it. Now, aren't you clever, Inspector? No, I'm not clever. Just thorough. You know how Barnes got rid of the other passengers on the missing plane, Faraday? Sure, I do. It was just as you said, Blackie. He had his pal Gus Johnson go to the airlines, dressed as a policeman, and get a passenger list. Then Johnson and his pal Joe called up all the passengers, pretended to be airline ticket agents, and canceled their reservations. Which is what they did to me, too, only guess Johnson used my reservation. Sure, Johnson used it. He used it so he could get rid of that plane. Uh, this is all very interesting, gentlemen, but none of it concerns me. No? Now, we'll why see. should I want to steal a plane? Why should I have Johnson go to all the trouble of canceling 20 plane reservations? Well, that's easy, Barnes. You didn't want Johnson to go to the trouble of having to kill 20 passengers. The three members of the crew were trouble enough. Well, if it was trouble, it was Johnson's trouble, not mine. I just don't see any connection between the missing plane and me. Well, I do. Your pal Johnson knew Blackie had mailed that murder gun to me. A gun which would prove you killed Bradley. A gun which would send you to the chair. Oh, really? Uh, what uh, happened to that gun, Blackie? You don't know what happened to it, Barnes. It went down where that plane Johnson stole. Oh, did it? What a shame. Well, I guess you don't want me for anything more, do you? I want plenty with you, Barnes. I know you killed Bradley. I know you engineered the theft of that plane and the murder of its crew. I know you killed Gus Johnson. Then why don't you arrest me? Because I want to do more than that. I want to send you to the chair. And I need the murder gun to do it. If it's your gun, then I've got you. Yes, but before you get me, you'll have to get that gun. <laughs> Gentlemen, I think I'll be going. Just a minute, Barnes. Faraday, you'll be able to convict Barnes if you have his gun? Sure I can, you know that. But how can I get it now? What's uh, this gun look like, Faraday? It looks like a gun. What should it look like? Your gun, probably. Because I just took it out of my pocket? Oh, no. It's Barnes' gun. The gun I stole from Gus Johnson. And I figured the best place to keep it was with me. That's, that's my gun? No, no, you put my gun in the mail. Oh, no, I put my gun in the mail. I knew I was being shadowed, so I wrapped up my gun, sealed, and mailed it for his benefit. I figured it was a way to take him off my trail. I didn't know Barnes here would try to get it even after it was in the mail. Give me that gun. Let me see it. Yeah, it's Barnes' gun, all right. And I think ballistics tests will show it was the gun that killed Bradley. Blackie, one of these days... Sit where you are, Barnes. Get used to sitting in a chair. Only the next one isn't going to be so comfortable. Where are we driving, Blackie? Out in the country to see Blondie White. You mind? No, I should say not. She helped you solve a murder case. She did more than help me, Mary. She was all the proof I needed that Barnes killed Gus Johnson. She kept a promise to tell me who killed Gus as soon as I proved Barnes killed Bradley. How did she know Barnes killed Gus? Well, Gus told her Barnes was coming to see him at 3 o'clock. A medical examination showed Gus was killed at about that time, and he hadn't had any other afternoon visitors besides us. Oh, I know why Gus was killed. Because he knew too much. He not only knew too much, Mary, he did it all himself. Now, wait a minute. You mean he actually stole that plane? Yes. He took my place on the plane. Then when the ship was in the air, he killed the hostess. Then he went to the cockpit and killed the pilot and co-pilot. And bailed out before the ship crashed? Oh, that was how he broke his leg, huh? Golly, what a chance he took. No, he didn't take any chance at all, Mary. I found out from Shorty, Gus had once been a stunt flyer. After he killed the crew, he took over the plane himself. And landed. I see. No, nope. you're wrong again. He headed it out toward the ocean. Just inside of the coast, he set the plane on automatic pilot, and then he bailed out. For goodness sake. And now that plane is somewhere at the bottom of the ocean. Yes, Mary. And even though something very clever went on up in the air, we figured it 
because we kept our feet on the ground. 